Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So today we are starting with another important chapter that is capital gains. First of all, we know that uh, the sections which are there in capital gains starts from section 45 till 55. So today we will be discussing all these sections. It's a very easy chapter, interesting also and at the same time equally important like PGBP. So capital gain is one of the uh, important chapter here in our syllabus. First of all, the charging section of capital gain. Section 45.1 is a charging section of capital gain and this section is uh, quite easy. It says that if it says two things, first of all, there must be a capital asset. There must be a capital asset must be there. And if the assessee has transferred such capital asset, then capital gain will arise. So on that particular transfer, if there is any profit, we will say it, it as a capital gain. And in case it is a loss, we will say it is a capital loss, right? So there can be a profit and loss on such transfer. But two things are important. Please remember this charging section says there must be a capital asset and it should be transferred. So first of all, the question is what is a capital asset? So it is defined in section 2 clause 14. So it is. Give me a moment. What is this? Okay, sorry, guys. So this is defined in section 214. It's a definition of capital assets. It says all assets, generally all assets are capital assets, whether they are personal, whether they are of business. Either they are movable assets or they are immovable assets. We will call all assets are capital assets. But it says that there are certain exceptions. So it says capital assets means property or assets of any kind. It could be movable, immovable, business or personal except the following. So we have five points over here. These, the assets which are mentioned in these points will not be considered as capital asset. So we know that if any of these assets are transferred, we will say that capital gain will not arise because why not? Because these are not capital assets. So what, what is one personal movable asset is not a capital asset. Personal movable assets example are like personal car. It's our personal and movable also personal furniture we have or personal computer, personal laptop, personal watch, etc. So these are all, uh, these are will not be considered as a capital asset. So if there is a question in your examination that a CSE has sold their personal car, their personal furniture, capital gain will not arise because it is not a capital asset. Then we will see stock in trade, rural agriculture, land, gold deposit bonds, special bearer bonds. These are not capital assets. But let me uh, first explain you about personal movable assets. So as I have already discussed that personal movable asset is not a capital asset. But again, there is certain exceptions. There are some personal movable assets where we will say that they will be considered as a capital asset. That is that if you will transfer such kind of assets, then capital gain will arise. And these uh, assets, you know that because they have uh, their value keeps on increasing. That, that is the reason. Income tax has said that they, they will be considered as a capital asset. What are those? Jewelry. So if a person is selling their gold, uh, they are selling gold, they are selling any uh, diamond, precious, semi-precious stones, it will be considered as a capital asset. Jewelry, precious, semi-precious stones will be considered. Paintings, drawings, sketches. What types of paintings? These expensive paintings, expensive drawings, sculptures, archaeological collections, any work of art, these all will be considered as a capital asset sculptures, archaeological collections, any work of art. Even I have written securities over here. That is if you will sell your shares, debentures or other securities, bonds, etc. They will be also be considered as a capital asset. So all these assets are, we understand it could be personal because you uh, assessee might have their personal jewelry, personal diamonds, precious, semi-precious stones or paintings, sculptures, drawing, etc. So if they will sell this asset, they will transfer this asset uh, rather then capital gain will arise. Correct. Security is also capital gain will arise. Second thing is that stock in trade will not be considered as your capital asset. So because why not? Because if we will, we will be selling our stock in trade, then we understand there would be a PGBP income. Correct. So if I'm selling my stock, it would be a PGBP income. So, so stock in trade is not a capital asset. So please tell me, I have just said that gold, diamonds, etc. is a capital asset. But for whom? It is for a person who has invested in that gold, right? If a jeweler is selling their gold jewelry as a stock in trade, so which income it will uh, rise? It will be obviously be PGBP, correct? 
सो इफ यू आर सेलिंग स्टॉक एंड ट्रेड इट वुड बी पीजीबी पे इनकम बट हेयर इनकम टैक्स हैज मेंशन दैट दोज हु आर फॉरेन इंस्टीट्यूशनल इन्वेस्टर्स एफ आई आई बिकॉज दे आर इन टू दिस बिजनेस ऑफ सेलिंग देयर सिक्योरिटीज सो फॉर देम सिक्योरिटीज इज ऑल्सो स्टॉक एंड ट्रेड बट दे हैव स्पेसिफिकली एक्सक्लूडेड दैट फॉर एफ आई आई फॉरन इंस्टीट्यूशनल इन्वेस्टर्स इफ दे विल सेल देयर सिक्योरिटीज इट विल बी कंसिडर्ड एज अ कैपिटल सेट सो फॉर एफ आई आई कैपिटल गेन विल अराइज नॉट पी जी बी पी करेक्ट वाई इज इट सो यू विल गेट टू नो दिस इन फाइनल लेवल बिकॉज वी वुड लाइक टू गिव देम सर्टन एग्जामिशन एंड सर्टन कंसेशन इन टेक्स रेट दैट इज द रीजन वी हैव नॉट वी डोंट कंसिडर दैट इंडियन गवर्नमेंट डोंट कंसिडर दैट दिस एज देयर पी जी बी पी इनकम बिकॉज रेट्स ऑफ पी जी बी पी इज क्वाइट हायर रादर दैन कैपिटल गेन बिकॉज वी अंडरस्टैंड इन कैपिटल गेन वी हैव सब्सिडाइज और कंसेशनल टेक्स रेट दैट इज द रीजन अदरवाइज प्लीज एज अफ ना फॉर इंटरमीडिएट प्लीज लर्न दैट फॉर एफ आई आईज Uh, their securities will not be considered as their stock. It will be rather considered as a capital asset. Capital gain will arise for them, right? Okay. Third is rural agriculture land. Sir, we understand agriculture income is not taxable. I understand agriculture income is not taxable, but selling a land is not agriculture income, right? So, if you have an agriculture land, and if you transfer this, if you sell this agriculture land, then capital gain will arise. but it depends whether it is an urban agriculture land or it is a rural agriculture land are you are you all getting this if it is a rural agriculture land capital gain will not arise why not because we will not consider a uh, we will not consider a rural agriculture land as a capital asset now the question is what is a rural agriculture land see if i tell you if there is any municipal corporation or any municipality or any cantonment board So let's say this is a municipal corporation. This is the limit of a municipal corporation. Let's say the city in which you live in. It's a municipal corporation or a cantonment board. This is the limit of a municipal corporation. So if any land is situated here in the municipal corporation within the limits of municipal corporation, it will be treated as urban. It will be treated as urban. So if there is any land which is beyond the limits of this municipal corporation, it could be. treated as a rural agriculture land but it depends upon how far it is located from this municipal uh, corporation and what is the population two things are mandatory over here how far it is located from the nearest municipal location from the nearest municipal uh, corporation how far it is located second thing is that it depends on the pop, uh, population also because if you logically see if a if any area if any town vicinity has a La as a huge population, then we cannot say it is a rural. We say rural which has a very less population. So it depends upon the population also and how far the uh, this land particular land is located. So let's say, let's say there is an assessee. He says, sir, I have sold a land. It is used for agriculture purpose, and I have sold a land. Now our uh, uh, concern is that we have to determine whether that land is a rural agricultural land or a urban agricultural land. so if we will say that sir my land is situated within the municipal limits we will say it's an urban agriculture land capital gain will arise on that okay but if it is beyond that particular uh, limit then it depends how far it is so if it is 2 km far from here if it is this line is 2 km far from here which is outside the limit of a municipality it could be a municipal corporation it could be a cantonment board also so if it is 2 km away within within this limit so if the population of this particular area if the population of this particular area is not more than 10000 that is up to 10000 then we will say this area in the, if you have a land in this area it will be considered as a rural agricultural land so in case the population of this place is let's say 8000 or 9000 or not more than 10000 10000 also it's fine it will be considered as a rural agricultural land but if the population of this place is let's say 11000 so we will say no it is not ru uh, rural it, it will be agri uh, urban agricultural land and capital gain will arise in that case okay you got it <clears throat> i'm so sorry guys so if there is any land which is beyond this limit and which is within 2 kilometers then we have to see the population up to 10000 10000 or less rural if it is more than 10000 urban okay then what will us uh, say if he will tell us no sir my land is quite far from this place how much far it is it is let's say from this place it is up to 
6 km that is if I look at from here still here it was 2 km so I can say the land is somewhere which, which is beyond 2 km and up to 6 km I have written it meters no sorry it is kilometers okay so if a land is situated somewhere over here here we have will see whether the population is up to 1 lakh if it is up to 1 lakh that is 1 lakh or less we will say it is a rural agricultural land if it is more than 1 lakh it will be an urban agricultural land right on urban agriculture and capital gain will arise okay let's say if his land is beyond 6 kilometer but up to maximum 8 kilometer that is 6 to 8 if his land is situ situated somewhere up over here beyond 6 but up to 8 that is next to then we will look at the population we will say if the population is up to 10 lakh if it is up to 10 lakh it would be a rural agriculture land so let's say his land is situated 7 kilometers from this place so 7 kilometers will come in this range correct 6 to 8 then we will determine what, what, what was the population as per the last census let's say the population was 7 lakh, 8 lakh, 9 lakh or 10 lakh, we will say it would be a rural agriculture land. If it is more than 10 lakh, let's say 10.1 lakh, 10.2, 11 or 12, we will say it's an urban agriculture land, correct? And if the land is situated beyond 8 kilometers, then there is no uh, point in uh, seeing the population also. If it is beyond 8 kilometers, then you can simply say it is, it will be a rural agriculture land. Got it? So this is the definition of rural agriculture land. Let us uh, let me once again uh, come on this point. Let us say if a land is situated over here, if the land is situated in this place, in the vicinity of that municipal corporation, we will say it is a urban agriculture land. If the land is situated within 0 to 2 kilometers, then we will look at the population. If it is not more than 10,000 rural, if it is more than 10,000 urban, if it is more uh if the land is situated beyond two kilometers but beyond two up till six that is two to six we will see the population of one lakh and if it is beyond six six to eight ten lakh population beyond eight lakh it will be uh always be an uh, rural agriculture land got it so rural agriculture land will not be treated as a capital asset if capital gain if you will sell this such kind of rural agriculture land capital gain will not arise it will not be taxable Got it? So I have already discussed what a rural agriculture land is. This is everything that is written in this book. And if you sell gold deposit bonds or special bearer bonds, special bearer bonds, although not in much trend now, because initially uh, somewhere in 1991 or so, government used to issue such types of bonds. But they, because at that, at that point of time, government needs money. So they have given incentives to people that please come and invest in government bonds and we will what we will give you uh, if you will sell th uh, these bonds then we will not tax you that, that, that is the reason they came out with the special bearer bonds and gold deposit bonds are like digital gold if you invest in gold deposit bonds generally these are issued by RBI so if you invest in gold deposit bond because this uh, the value of this bond is very much related to the value of gold so uh, to uh, give incentives to the people because India is one of the highest consuming consumer of gold and we don't produce gold that much right we most of the gold uh, we import it either it is from Switzerland it is, it is uh, from Gulf countries especially UAE or other African countries so we don't actually produce so much gold but we are the highest consumer of gold in the world so a government wants that people should purchase gold but that too in digital form so that is the reason they came out with a, dip, a gold deposit scheme. So if you uh, purchase gold in, uh, in this digital form that we call as gold deposit bonds, in that case they have given you incentives that whenever you will sell this gold, capital gain will not be taxable because it is will not be treated as a capital asset. Got it? So these this is important. So because we understand that 45 one says there must be a capital asset. So these are the capital assets. If all properties are capital assets. But yes, we have some points over here. It will be considered that this will be not be considered as a capital asset, right? Okay. Now the question is, now we understand what is a capital asset and when, whenever we will be transferring this capital asset, capital gain will arise. Now the question is, 
when will short term or long term will arise right so it depends there are two types of capital gain long term and short term and it depends upon the holding period the period of holding period of holding starts from the date of acquisition up to the date of transfer if this period of holding generally speaking if this period of holding is more than three years more than three years i am saying then long term will arise right long term gain or long term loss whatever the case is but if you are transferring any capital asset after three years there are exceptions also we will see uh, there are some cases where we will see only one year or two years also but generally speaking it is three years so after three years if you are transferring the asset long term within three years or exit three years also short term got it so generally speaking after three years long term within three years or exit three years also short term but there are cases where we will see very few cases are there where we will replace this three years by two years and one year also let me first explain you about one year there are four assets there are four assets and mainly they are financial instruments they are mainly financial instruments so there are four assets for them we will see only one year condition so if they are getting transferred after one year right after completing one year long term within one year or up to one year exact one year they will be short term so what are these first of all mainly they are financial instruments first of all they are listed securities i have said listed securities it includes securities includes shares it includes debentures bonds or any securities so if they are listed listed means listed on any of the stock exchanges so if you are transferring any listed securities after one year it will be long term right second thing is that equity oriented units of mutual fund you understand what are mutual funds and what are equity oriented mutual funds those mutual fund schemes where uh, they invest uh, 65 percent or more of their corpus towards equity that is called equity oriented mutual funds so if you are selling these units which, which are equity oriented units of a mutual fund after one year it will be long term right so listed securities equity oriented units of mutual fund units of uti zero coupon bonds uti units unit uti is also one of the mutual fund or zero coupon bonds so if you are selling these if you are transferring these assets these four assets after one year they will be always be long term and within one year or up to one year exact it will be short term right what about two years there are two types of assets uh, for them we will see two years one is very simple land or building that is immovable asset so if a assessee is transferring their land or their building or both after two years we will say it is a long term right within two years if they are transferring it after one year 1.5 years or exact two years also short term after two years it will become long term correct second is unlisted shares please mind my uh, words over here we, i have written shares not securities so if there is any unlisted share these shares can be equity shares these can be uh, your preference shares also so if you are selling your unlisted shares after two years it will be long term within two years short term right so if they are listed shares for listed it is one for unlisted it is two tell me what is uh, what you will do of unlisted debentures see unlisted is not covered over here there was only listed securities which after one year unless if there are if it is a listed debenture after one year it will become long term but what about unlisted debentures unlisted was not here and here only unlisted shares is there correct so other assets for other assets we will see three years so for unlisted debentures so you will see three years correct now there is one important amendment there is actually a section which i'll be uh, discussing with you later also 50 double a there is a section 50 double a which is introduced by this finance act and it is applicable for our 2024 examinations also it has come up with two assets it has come up with two assets and this section it's a very special section although it's a very small section very it's a very small section and it says that if these two kinds of assets will be transferred any time after one year two year three year five year ten year twenty year whenever they will be transferred we will always consider it as a short term we will always consider this as a short term so there are two assets there one is market linked debentures market linked debentures are those debentures where returns are linked to the market fluctuate uh, fluctuations right so it, it is not a fixed return uh, debentures it is a market linked debentures so uh, i i believe that you are able to recall this so there are two assets market linked debentures and units of specified mutual funds specified mutual funds are those funds 
which invest not more than 35% of their corpus into equity. So if you will transfer these two assets, market linked debentures and unit of specified mutual funds, so they will always be short term. And what was the logic behind that? We have already done in our regular lecture. I believe that you are able to recall this. But please, students, please remember that because this is something which is important and it can come in your MCQ also. So for market link debenture, please uh, mug up this uh, particular, these two types of instruments, mar especially market link debentures. Market link debentures, there is no holding period for it. It will always be short term. Market link debentures and units of specified mutual funds, right? These are not equity oriented. Equity oriented are those where 65% or more is invested into equity. Here, not more than 35% is invested in equity, right? So uh, there is a small section 50 double also. It says same thing. It says same thing. It says about two assets. They will always be and always be short term. Please remember this. This is a bit important for your 2024 examinations. Okay. Now we know what is capital asset. We know the charging section 45.1. We know when short term or long term will arise. Now the question is how we will compute our uh, capital gain. And this computation is very easy. I tell you simple class sixth formula, which we have learned in our school, even in class five. Also, you might have learned this. You might have, uh, have learned this. What it was selling price minus cost price is equal to profit. The same formula will apply over here while calculating capital gain selling price minus cost price. What is selling price in capital gain? We call it full value of consideration. So full value of consideration is nothing but the selling price and cost price is cost of acquisition. So what you have to do is from full value of consideration that is selling price subtract your cost. Cost could be in the form of cost of acquisition. It can be also in the form of cost of improvement and what extra expense expense on transfer you just have to deduct these three costs cost of acquisition cost of improvement and expense on transfer you will get your capital gain simple formula selling price minus cost price so for uh for selling price you will say full value of consideration and you have to deduct three cost uh i have deduct first expense on transfer so that you can get net consideration why i have done this because uh uh, when we will do section 54 f or other sections their net consideration plays an important role so that is the reason i have said net consideration net consideration is nothing but net selling price so for whatever amount you have sold any asset if you have incurred any expenses on transferred any selling expenses you deduct that you get your net consideration so uh some of you might have done that first you will uh, deduct cost of acquisition cost of improvement then expense on transfer i have deducted first at the first place so there is no problem as such just i have deducted at the first place itself so full value of consideration minus expense on transfer you will get net consideration that is the net selling price after that you will deduct your cost of acquisition and if there is any cost of improvement what is cost of cost of improvement any capital expenditure if you have any good then you can also deduct that also here then you will get your capital gain and which type of capital gain you will get this is short term capital gain because you understand if it is a long term capital gain, then you have to index this cost of acquisition and cost of improvement. Why? Because due to inflation, your cost might have uh, have increased. So income tax gives us an advantage that says if it is a long term, if it is a long term, you can index your cost of acquisition and cost of improvement. And I believe that you know how to index your cost of acquisition, and cost of improvement. You have uh, your CIS. So with the help of CI, you can index also. I'll tell you how. OK. So second thing is that how you will compute your long term capital gain almost same formula just the difference is for cost of acquisition cost of improvement you have to take indexation cost of acquisition cost of improvement although there is certain exceptions there are certain cases where an asset even if it is a long term asset we don't index but generally speaking for all long term we will generally index uh, cost of acquisition cost of improvement. So for uh, how do you compute your long term? You tell for full value of consideration, less expense on transfer, you will get net consideration. And from net consideration, please deduct index cost of acquisition and index cost of improvement. And how you will calculate this index cost of acquisition? You have the formula. What is the formula? Tell me. See how you will get your index. Index cost of acquisition. So whatever is the cost of acquisition, you have to adjust it with the inflation. So how you will adjust it? Uh, CII would be given to you in the question itself. Cost inflation index. It will be given to you. You no need to remember that cost of uh, CII for every year. 
but i would recommend i would recommend that for this current year you should remember and uh, the one from where it is started that is 2001 and 2 you should know the ci of these two years so for this year for this financial year 23 24 we have ci 348 although it will be given to you by in the question itself right no need to remember it but still it's my recommendation at least you should know these two cis 2001 and 2 it was started it was 100 these are the two ci which you should know otherwise it was just a recommendation it will be given in your question itself okay so how you will index your cost of acquisition so whatever is your cost of acquisition was cost of acquisition means so your purchase amount whatever uh, the purchase cost was cost of acquisition was you have to index it by taking in numerator you will take cii of the year of transfer divided by cii of the year in which it is first held by SSC. This is simple. This is very simple. It says that whenever you have got this asset in, the, uh, in that year, that year when you have received this asset, which was first held by you, you have to index from that very year, right? Until which date? Till the year in which it is transferred. So in the numerator, you will write, let's say it is getting transferred in 23, 24. So in the numerator, you will write 348 divided by in any year where you have acquired this asset, you have received this asset. So in which in uh, which it was first held by assets, held by assets means in which in the year which where you have acquired this asset or you can say you can receive this asset. But yes, there is one exception also. Whenever you get this asset from the previous owner, let's say there is an assessee who has received this asset from his father or grandfather or his mother. If they have received the asset from the previous owner, then we understand that there is a very famous judgment, which is Manjula Jesha. There is a High Court judgment, Bombay High Court judgment of Manjula Jesha. It says that in that case, you should take, you can take in fact, and even we will advise our uh, clients also that they should take this uh, uh, advantage of uh, this case Manjula Jesha because it is favorable to the SSC. So in that case, you will take the CI of the year in which it was acquired by your previous owner. It was acquired your previous owner. So in that case, you take the holding period. You also include the holding period of the previous owner also that I'll tell you later on itself. So simply uh, what you can do is you can uh, take this formula as cost of acquisition into CI of the year of transfer divided by CI of year of acquisition. Simply you can uh, keep it like this divided by CI of the year of acquisition, correct? And similarly, you will do the index cost of, uh, of improvement also, index cost of improvement also, same formula you will apply, cost of improvement, CI of the year of transfer divided by CI of the year of improvement, correct? And I, as I've already mentioned you that this year CI is 348, no need to learn, it will be mentioned in the question itself. Okay, but recommended, it's recommended that you should learn this. Okay. What if, if there is any asset which is acquired before 1-4-2001? So you understand if there is any asset which is acquired before 1-4-2001, we have to index it. We cannot take any CI which is of that year because we don't have the CI of that year. The last CI which, ha which we have, that, that is the first CI which we have is just 100, right? So in that case, if any asset is acquired before 1-4-2001, you have to index that, but here you will take as a CI of the year of acquisition as 100. Second thing is that what would be the cost of acquisition in that case? You understand here you will take cost of acquisition as the actual cost, whatever is, whatever is your actual cost was or fair market value as on 1 4 2001, whichever is higher, whichever is higher you will take. So in case if there is any asset which you have acquired before 1-4-2001 because you understand you don't have the CI of that year, you don't have the CI of before 2001, you don't have CI of 98, 99 or 1992, right? So in that case, we have given you an advantage. One, first of all, we have given you an advantage that you can take, take the cost as actual cost or fair market value as on 1-4-2001, whichever is higher, you can take it. Because why we have given this advantage? Because we don't have the CI of that year, right? The first CI we have is just 100 of 2001 or 2. So 
In case the asset is acquired before 14 2001, the CI of the year in which it is, t is taken as 100 and the fair market value as on 14 2001 or the actual cost, whichever is higher, you have to take, take that, right? But there are certain exceptions also we will see in section 55. Uh, if you are selling goodwill or you are selling any rights of manufacture or uh, right to produce anything or other intangible assets, for that, this uh, facility is not available that i'll discuss in section 55 but generally speaking if you're selling any asset and if it is acquired before 14 2001 you have to take the actual cost of fair market values in 14 2001 whichever is higher but remember in case of land or building in case of land and building stamp value is more important so should we take the stamp value no if a land or building is acquired if a land or building is acquired by the sec or their previous owner before 14 2001 in that case, you have to take the actual cost or fair market value of 142,000 when whichever is higher that I have explained for other assets. But for land and building, you have to consider the stem value also. You have to consider the stem value also. So first of all, the fair market value of 142,001, this is only for land or building, right? Land, building or both. So if uh, first of all, you have to take the fair market value of 142,001 and if the, if the stem value is not given in the question then you can ignore that then there is no problem then you can ignore that but if stem value is mentioned in the question so please take the stem value also into consideration take the stem value as on 142001 first of all you have to take the lower amount of it fair market value or stem value whichever is lower first of all take this value and then compare this value with actual cost whichever is higher got it so in this case, in the case of land or building or both, if it is acquired by the SAC or the previous owner before 142001, generally for other assets we take it, actual cost or fair market value as on 142001, whichever is higher. But in this case, first please consider FMV as on 142001 or stem value if it is given in the question. If it is not given, ignore. If it is given fair market value or stem value, whichever is lower, then compare this least amount with the actual cost whichever is higher will be taken as your cost of acquisition got it so this i have mentioned over here in case of land or building or both if stem value is of uh, if stem value of 142001 is available it is given in your question then you have to take the fair market value stem value value whichever is lower and then then compare this least amount with the actual cost whichever is higher would become your actual cost of acquisition right it will become your cost of acquisition and this also please remember that any improvement incurred, any improvement which you have done before 1-4-2001, you don't have to take that improvement. You have to ignore that improvement. So all improvement which are incurred after, on or after 1-4-2001 should only be taken. If it is before, then you have to ignore it. Why you are ignoring it? Because you have already taken the fair market value as the cost. So you don't have to take this improvement. Always please ignore uh, the improvement which are incurred, which were incurred before 14-2001, right? And as I was mentioning that for long-term capital gain, you do cost of, uh, you do indexation of cost of acquisition. But there are certain cases, but there are certain cases which we will read uh, later in uh, later part of this lecture also, that in some cases we are not supposed to do indexation of cost of acquisition. Uh, I'll uh, do uh, with the... Um, in case of slum sale in section 50b in case of slum sale indexation is not allowed even if it is long term whenever we uh, sell any depreciable asset then indexation is not allowed that we will see in section 50 and also in case of debentures if you are selling debentures or bonds then indexation is not allowed even if it is long term you understand debenture if it is a listed debentures or bonds so after one if it is listed debentures after one year it will be long term but indexation is not allowed for debentures if it is unlisted debentures after three years it will be long term but indexation is not allowed for debentures but again there is one more exception to this as well for debentures and bonds indexation is not allowed but if these debentures are either uh, if this debenture bonds are capital index bond or seven gold bonds if they are capital index bond or seven gold bonds then indexation is allowed capital index bonds their returns are generally linked to market they are uh, based on in inflation so for that indexation is allowed seven gold bonds these are not gold deposit mode no gold deposit mode is some a bit different seven gold bonds are also linked with their uh, value is linked with gold as gold fluctuate their value also their value also gets fluctuated 
but they have the, the difference between gold deposit bond and seven gold bonds is that on seven gold bonds these are also issued by rbi but they give rate of interest also they give 2.5 percent simple interest also on these bonds but there is no interest on gold deposit bond gold deposit bond is not a capital asset but seven gold bond is a capital asset right i'll talk about more about seven gold bonds in section 47 so i was telling you debentures and bonds even if it is long term indexation will not be allowed but yes if it is capital index bond this can come in your mcq guys so if it is a uh, no indexation fourth point says that no indexation in case of debenture and bonds except cibs and seven gold bonds cibs capital index bond indexation is allowed for cibs and seven gold bonds also indexation is allowed right i'll talk more about seven gold bonds in section 47 okay one more important amendment this is one more important amendment which can again come in an examination because all these amendments are very important for taxation paper whatever the amendment is generally examiner asks most of the thing uh more than 25 percent of the paper 20 to 30 percent of the paper con consists of consists of amendments so this amendment becomes very important for us so this is one more amendment and it says it's a very small amendment though okay this i'll explain you with an example it's a very easy amendment it says that let's say there is a assessee and who has sold his house there was a house property and he is now selling it and capital gain will arise let's say the selling price is now he is selling this property of rupees 90 lakh which was purchased or constructed by him a long time back some six seven eight years back it was constructed or purchased by him now he's selling it so we'll say full value of consideration how much is the selling price let's say it is he's selling it for rupees 90 lakh okay and we have to do the index of cost of acquisition also so this person was saying sir actually my cost of acquisition was consists of different things he says sir first i have purchased the land okay so he has purchased the land and he has incurred let's say 25 lakh rupees uh, as a purchase cost for purchasing this land and then he has started constructing this building also and on construction let's say he's he has spended another uh, 20 lakh rupees okay so 45 lakh we will say okay 45 lakh is your cost right but he's saying uh he's saying no sir there is some other cost also actually i have taken a loan for constructing this house or for acquiring this particular land i have taken a loan also and there is a interest also which is related to the period till this house was constructed it was it should be my capital expenditure and he's saying sir there was an interest amounting rupees 5 lakh which was related to that period that was uh, up to the date of construction okay and he's saying sir this is also my cost and he's saying that sir uh, my total cost is how much it will be 50 lakh okay if he can prove here that it is his capital expenditure this can be taken as a cost also but 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 now there is an amendment here it says that if assessee you have already claimed this interest as a deduction in any earlier years because we understand we have section 24b where you can claim deduction uh, related to your pre-construction period interest so if you have already claimed a deduction either under section 24b or we have sections like we will do this in our uh, deductions chapter revision also if you have already claimed a deduction under section 80 double e 80 eea which is related to first time home buyers right do you able to recall these sections which uh, which is available to first time home buyers there are certain uh, conditions that we will do in our uh, deductions chapter revision as well all in all income tax is saying that if you have you can make this interest as your cost of acquisition but first we will check whether you have claimed any deduction in the past also if you have already claimed a deduction regarding this 5 lakh you have already claimed a deduction in any of these sections 24b 80 double e or 80 eea then you have already taken the benefit then we will not make this as a part of your cost so this is an amendment so we will not take this if you have already claimed this deduction either in any of these sections then we will not going to give this uh, we will not take this as a part of your cost of acquisition or cost of improvement as the case may be so in that case it would be 25 plus 20 only it will not be 5 lakh correct so this is the amendment over here so it says the cost of acquisition or cost of improvement should not include should not include what it should not include 
द डिडक्शन ऑफ इंटरेस्ट क्लेम अंडर सेक्शन ट्वेंटी फोर बी एटी और ए दीज टू सेक्शन वी विल सी लेटर ऑल्सो इन चैप्टर सिक्स ए रिविजन इज वेल right so you got the point if this amendment was very much logical because we cannot give double deduction to the assessee we cannot give uh, this benefit twice to him because if this person has already claimed a deduction in the section 24b 80ee or 80eea so this person has already taken a deduction why we will give him one more deduction right now in a case of capital gain you, we will not make it part of your cost of acquisition or cost of improvement correct okay now some other special sections first we will discuss 45 1a no need to remember the section number but still you should know the provision this is quite an important section in short scale very easy a short section a very small section it says because we understand that if a uh, assessee has any capital asset and if it gets destroyed it gets damaged and insurance company gives that person a claim then also capital gain will arise so this section says that if Uh, you have an asset which got damaged or which got destroyed and you receive a claim then capital gain will also arise just one point over here is that capital gain will arise in the year capital gain will arise it will the capital gain will be arise in the year in the year wh whenever the asset is transferred so let's say in the previous year 22 23 this asset got damaged this asset got damaged so the transfer took place in this year but this is quite a special section it says that in this year we will not tax you we will not going to tax you in this year whenever you will receive the insurance claim whenever you will receive the insurance claim we are going to uh, tax in that particular year right so capital gain transfer will be in this year no doubt transfer will be in this year but it will be taxed in the year whenever you will receive the insurance claim so whatever the amount will which insurance company will give it to you it can be uh, it will be regarded as a full value of consideration that is the selling price right it will be uh, same like as if you are selling this asset to the insurance company so insurance company is giving you x amount so that x amount will be considered as your full value of consideration right let's say if insurance company is giving you in cash cash means in the form of money then it's no problem but if they are giving you in the form of kind let's say if they are giving you any other asset so whatever is the market value of that asset we will consider that as your full value of consideration just the special thing over here is that we will be going to tax you we will going to tax the assessee in the year when in which the uh, claim is received although if it is a long term uh, asset then we have to do the indexation also but indexation should be done up to the year till the asset was transferred that is till the asset was damaged right because we understand uh you already know that whenever we have to calculate the index cost of acquisition it means cost of acquisition into ci of the year of transfer so let's say uh, the same case which i was discussing let's say the asset got destroyed in the previous year 22 23 but you have received the insurance claim in previous year 23 24 so in 23 24 you are going to arise the capital gain capital gain will be taxed over here but the asset was transferred in this year so you have to take in the numerator in this case you have to take the ci of this year of previous year 22 23 right correct so you will going to take this in this case only right in this case there are some other cases also special cases but generally speaking section 45 one says the charging section says whenever the asset gets transferred we are going to tax you but this is one of the special cases there are some other cases also but this is one of them of insurance claim so it it says that if there is any capital asset which is got damaged or destructed and insurance claim is received then the full value of consideration is whatever the amount which you are getting from the insurance company and if it is in kind you, you can take the market value if it is both in kind and the cash then you can club that right that will become your selling price full value of consideration important note over here is, is that capital gain will be taxable we will tax that particular assessee in the year when the claim is received however indexation will be done up to the year of transfer right next is 452 452 is again a very important it says conversion of capital asset into stock in trade so whenever assessee converts their capital asset into stock in trade it will be also be regarded as transfer so let's say there is an assessee he has his gold he has his gold he is not a jeweler but he has his gold so gold is a capital asset so let's say in the year somewhere in 2010 11 he has purchased gold 
of rupees let's say 10 lakh he has purchased the gold so he was holding gold with him but after some year let's say uh, in the year which i take many in previous year 2021 he um, he started the business of jewelry he becomes a jeweler and because he was having gold also as his personal capital asset he has converted he converts this personal gold into stock in trade so this is what we call conversion of capital because gold is a capital asset right it was not stock in trade earlier but in this year because now he has opened a jewelry showroom jewelry shop now he is converting his gold into his stock in trade so this will also be regarded as transfer and capital gain will arise in this case but here it would be a special treatment so what we will see so in this year this was converted into stock this was converted into stock is he selling this right now no he has just converted this into stock now he would like to sell it but it is not sold as of now so let's say the fair market value of this gold on this day this is important what is the fair market value it will be mentioned in your question so let's say the initially the gold was 10 lakh rupees but the fair market value on the date of conversion let's say it is mentioned in your question it is let's say 18 lakh okay transfer is happening capital gain will arise because there is a capital asset which is getting transferred and it is duly covered under the definition of a uh, transfer that whenever you convert your capital asset into stock then we will assume that it is a transfer okay but we are not going to text you right now we will wait till when when it will be actually sold in that year we will going to text this capital gain okay so this section says that whenever you will convert your asset into stock in trade although it will be regarded as transfer but we will wait until and unless this stock is actually sold okay so let's say this stock is actually getting sold somewhere in this previous year this is previous year 23 24 this stock is getting sold please tell me what is getting sold stock so if stock is getting sold that is my pgbp income so here my pgbp income will also arise so let's say we are selling this gold for rupees 21 lakh we are selling this gold for rupees 21 lakh okay so in this year there will be two income there will be two income one is of course your pgbp because you are now selling your stock and second is the capital gain because we have not text you earlier this capital gain which we have not text you earlier in this year now we are going to text you so in capital gain will arise in the year when in which this stock is actually getting sold so capital gain will also arise now it is very easy to calculate how how much would be the pgvp and how much much would be the capital gain this is very logical see tell me how much is pgvp very easy uh you are setting uh, selling this stock is for how much 21 lakh and how much is the purchase price sir actually we have not purchased we have purchased it long back but uh, that time when we have purchased it was my capital asset okay so at, at on which date it becomes your stock so sir this uh was somewhere in 2021 it becomes our stock so we will see what is the fair market values this is the the white line which you are seeing here this portion is related to your pgvp so simply you will calculate your pgvp whatever is the selling price minus we will assume that this is the stock purchase price whenever it has come into our business so it was deemed to be purchased at this fair market value that is 18 lakh so 21 minus 18 this portion will be your pgvp so 21 minus 18 is 3 lakh would be your pgvp and how much would be your capital gain because in this year although it was regarded as transferred but we have not texted it in that year we have waited for some time right so this minus this this period was your capital gain period so uh, 18 minus 10 lakh 8 lakh would be your capital gain right selling price would be considered as what would be the full value of consideration for capital gain purpose the fair market value and on the date of conversion that would be 18 lakh minus cost of acquisition is 10 lakh and if it is this period if if it is short term then you can simply say 18 minus 10 but here it is long term because it is almost 10 years now so you will say how you will calculate your capital gain full value of consideration would be considered as the fair market value on the date of conversion 18 lakh minus cost of acquisition if it is short term and if it is long term then you will do the indexation also so here in this case 18 minus you will do the indexation for 10 lakh so let's say after indexation it comes to let's say 50 uh 
14 lakh. Let's say I am just taking it randomly. Let's say after indexation it comes to 14 lakh. So 18 minus 14, that would be 4 lakh would be your capital gain. Got it? So this is quite an important section. So whenever you can convert your capital asset into stock in trade, then also capital gain arise. But we don't tax in that very year. We have to wait till this asset is actually getting get, get sold. So whenever the asset gets sold, there in that year two income will arise. One is PGVP and other is capital gain. And this is very easy to determine. This is the PGVP area and this is the capital gain area. Got it? So I have mentioned it here as well. See the same type of uh, diagram I have mentioned it in your book also. So this is the holding period. This is the capital gain area and this conversion after conversion. This would be the PGVP area. Correct. So this fair market value question will tell you. Okay. Again, an important section 45.5 compulsory acquisition of capital asset. Whenever, uh, although there are some other sections also in between them, uh, 45.3 is there, 45.4 is there, but now they are omitted from CA intermediate course. Now they are part of CA final only. So we have only few sections in section 45. One was regarding your insurance claim. Second is regarding your conversion of capital asset into stock in trade. And the third is this one, compulsory acquisition of capital asset. That's it. The course is a bit reduced here in new course, in new syllabus. Okay. So 45.5 is regarding compulsory acquisition of capital asset. So if we have any capital asset, which is compulsory acquired, who acquires this compulsory? We are not voluntary selling it, but we have to sell. Why? Because there is some uh, government project or a government is doing something. They are making metro, they are making any uh, highway and they would like to compulsory acquire our capital asset. So generally it happens with immovable property. So either it is central government, state government, local authority, they are compulsory acquiring our capital asset. In that case also capital gain will arise because they also pay you, right? It doesn't mean that they are compulsory acquiring, they will not give you any money. They give you a handsome amount of money. So that will become the selling price, right? So whatever the compensation which government is giving to us, that will be our selling price. We will call it a full value of consideration. And whatever the cost was, whatever was actual cost was, that will become our cost of acquisition and if it is a long term you have to do the indexation also right and yes if it is uh, purchased before 1 4 2001 then you have the option you have to take the actual cost of fair market value as in 1 4 2001 whichever is earlier here just just the difference over here is the same this is very much related to insurance claim here also let's say uh, there is an assessee whose whose uh, building got compulsory acquired let's say on 15th of march 2023 that is in previous year this is this date is belongs to which previous year 22 23 so his house let's say his house or his building got compulsory acquired on this date so in this date capital gain will arise we will consider this as a transfer right but government pays us money government pays us money let's say after one month they pays us money somewhere on uh, 16th of april 2023 so we receive money in the previous year 2324 but this was get got transferred in the year in which it was compulsory acquired that is in the previous year 2324 so in this case also generally we know generally we know char general charging section says whenever the asset is transferred we will go going to tax you but these are some special provisions here in case of compulsory acquisition Whenever we will receive the compensation from the government, whenever we receive the compensation the government, in that case, we will going to tax that as you see, right? But yes, indexation will be done till the year in which it was compulsory acquired. So here in this case, I was saying that it was compulsory acquired in previous year 22, 23, although we have received the amount in previous year 23, 24. So in the year when this compensation was first received in the year, we are going to tax you, but yes, if it is a long term, we are going to give uh, index the cost also, cost of acquisition, cost of improvement also. But in the numerator, CI of the year of transfer, we take CI of the year of transfer, it will be, it was transferred in this year, correct? So it says whenever a capital asset is acquired compulsory by any government or local authority, generally these are the people who acquire it compulsory, capital gain will arise. However, it will be taxable in the year. We are going to tax that assets in the year whenever the compensation is first received. I'm saying whenever the compensation is first received. Let's say government says that we will give you a compensation of 60 lakh rupees. 
and let's say for uh, they give this in installment generally they don't give an installment they give you the full compensation but still let's say if your question says that this we we have received an installment in previous year 23 24 we have received 50 lakh and in previous year 24 25 we have received 10 lakh rupees right so although compensation was 60 lakh right but in this year we have received 50 and next year we have received 10 lakh rupees so what we will do whenever the compensation is first received we are going to tax you so in this year itself we are going to tax you and what will be the full value of consideration sir we have received 50 so we should we take 50 no whatever the compensation was decided you have to take that although we understand that you have just received 50 SSC has just received 50 but the compensation was decided at 60. so whenever whether it is a partial compensation which you have received or a complete compensation you have received whenever you have first received we are going to tax you and we will take the full value of consideration as the total compensation which the government has decided to pay you right and holding period you understand we have to take up to the date of transfer that is in the year in which it was uh, actually compulsory acquired we have to take the indexation up to that particular period if let's say government pays you 60 lakh rupees as compensation but after some time if assessee thinks no no i have get, got a very less compensation L let me uh, go and sue the government in this case they have taken an advantage at, at that time they were compulsory acquiring my asset i was not in a um, good state of mind and at that time they have compulsory acquired but they have given me a very less compensation let let me go and sue them okay so this person go and sue the them in court and let's say he uh win this case and now the government is paying some extra amount that is an enhanced compensation so now if government is paying him enhanced compensation then again it is an income and which income it will be capital gain because why he's getting this enhanced compensation because of that particular property correct so whenever this enhanced compensation will be received it will be considered as again a capital gain whether it will be long term or short term it depends upon the original capital gain if original capital gain was long term it this will also be long term if original capital gain was short term it will accordingly be short term right and what would be the cost of acquisition in that case no cost of acquisition would be nil why because you have already claimed cost of acquisition earlier because whenever you have received the original compensation you have already detracted the cost so you cannot claim cost of acquisition over here cost of cost of acquisition cost of improvement would be zero but yes if there is any legal expenses you can claim that as an expense or transfer in that case so in case of enhanced compensation your ltcg or stcg will arise whatever you have received the enhanced compensation but let's say code has given you uh the judgment in your favor code has given the judgment in your favor that now government should pay you extra compensation but till the date whenever the compensation will be received then only you will make it your income if you have already won the case but still the compensation is not received you are not going to tax that particular SAC. so whenever the income is received actually received by the government then you have to pay the taxes also correct and if let's say government has passed an interim order they have not passed any final order let's say you you are demanding 20 lakh rupees as as extra compensation as enhanced compensation you are demanding 20 lakh rupees and this case was in the court of law uh the judge decided as of now judge decided okay on temporary basis we understand that there, there is a hardship which has happened to the uh, to the this particular person he should get uh, extra compensation but they are not sure about this 20 lakh but they are sure about 5 lakh rupees. they are quite sure with 5 lakh rupees so they pass an interim order interim order is just a in between order it's a temporary order so in between order they pass that okay government as of now give him 5 lakh rupees and later we will dis we will decide it at the time of final order so if you receive any compensation on the interim order right so in that case please do not tax it unless and until the final order is decided so interim compensation if you received you will not going to tax it unless and until the final order comes so compensation received on interim order will be taxable only at the time of final order not earlier than that right and if the compensation gets reduced if the compensation gets reduced let's say originally you have received a compensation of 60 lakh now it's a reverse case now government says we have given you extra compensation we are going to reduce it we have given you 60 lakh but your house your property was not even worth of rupees 40 lakh so we are uh, we are going to take the amount back from you so in case if there is a case of reduced compensation 
so you will say okay take the amount you will be uh, the assessor will become very sad now he has to pay the amount back to the government so he will pay he has to pay to the government but he will say sir we ha i have given my extra tax in that year actually i have received 60 lakh and capital gain was computed by taking selling price as 60 lakh but now you are taking some amount away from me so my selling price is reduced now so in this case if any amount is reduced if any amount is reduced then in that case we have to recalculate that original value what, whatever we have calculated in that particular year we have to go and recalculate that amount right and there will be refund you will get the refund also so in case the earlier compensation which is awarded to the SAC it gets reduced then we have to recalculate we have to go to that particular year and we have to do the recalculation and whatever is the tax refund it will be allowed to you okay next point is interest on delayed compensation you understand that if we receive interest on delayed compensation why because government has taken some extra time for paying a uh, compensation to you so for that they compensate you by giving you extra amount as interest on delayed compensation is this amount is also capital gain no why i am getting this amount because my compensation got delayed that is the reason i am getting this interest so this interest becomes my ifos income and in ifos we will see there is a flat deduction on such kind of interest on such kind of interest which you received on late compensation or late enhanced compensation which you have received there is a flat deduction of 50 percent so let's say if you have received 2.5 lakh as interest on delayed compensation straight away it will go in ifos straight away 50 percent deduction will be allowed so 1.25 lakh 50 percent deduction will be allowed 1.25 lakh would be your ifos income in that case again important point see we understand that if rural agriculture land gets compulsory required no problem sir rural agriculture land is not a capital asset capital gain will not rise but if urban agriculture land gets compulsory required urban agriculture land is a capital asset so please remember if we sell urban agriculture land voluntary if we are selling urban agriculture land voluntary capital gain will arise it will be taxable but if urban agriculture land is compulsory acquired by government if urban agriculture land is compulsory acquired by government in that case it is exempt under section 1037 it is exempt under section 37 so urban agriculture and i understand it is a capital asset but whenever you will sell this asset voluntarily it would be amount to capital gain but in case it is getting compulsory acquired it is exempt under section 1037 section 10 is okay you can just read uh, learn section, section 10 10 37 if you are able to um, remember this section number it's okay it's fine otherwise not necessary you just have to know that whenever urban agriculture land is compulsory acquired by government it is then exempt but yes if you receive any interest on delayed compensation interest on delayed compensation will become your ifos income of course 50 percent reduction is allowed correct okay let's come to another section section 46 section 46 says that whenever the company gets wind up you understand that at the time of winding up first of all company pays to the outsiders who those who are creditors debenture holders outside liabilities paid and once the outside liabilities paid then we pay to the shareholders because now the company is getting liquidated so what shareholder is doing is shareholder is giving his shares right and the company gives their assets to the shareholders so we can say from the shareholder point of view capital gain can arise why because he is getting the shares he is giving away his shares and is getting the assets received from the company and from the company's point of view we can also say that the capital gain is arising why because company is transferring their assets to the shareholder but in this case we will see section 47 also after this section so in section 47 47 is transactions where which is not regarded as transfer so it covers this point that whenever at the time of liquidation whenever at the time of liquidation company gives their assets to the shareholder it will not be regarded as transfer in the hands of company so whenever the company is giving these assets to us it will not be regarded as transfer in the hands of company but yes it will be regarded as if the shareholder is giving their share and they are receiving the assets from the company so whatever the assets which company has uh can, it can be capital assets also it can be cash also other assets also if they are giving it to the company so it can be said that this is the consideration for the shares which it is happening so in this case the capital gain will rise in the hands of shareholders so this is one thing which you should remember 
that whenever there is a liquidation in case of company, the shareholder has to transfer their share to the company. So whatever the amount they will receive, capital gain will arise in the hands of shareholder, not in the hands of company. This is first thing. Second thing is that because there is a concept of deemed dividend also here. I will also uh, cover deemed dividend concept in our IFOS revision section 222. But here is one of the section over there, section 222C. It says that whenever the company gets liquidated, whenever the company gets liquidated and if they have accumulated profit at that particular time, at the time of liquidation, if they have accumulated profit, then then it is assumed as if the company is paying dividend to the shareholders. So what we have to see is at the time when the liquidation is happening, at the time when the liquidation is happening, if the shareholder is transferring his shares and he is getting any uh, assets or uh, cash or other assets from the company, first of all, we will see is there any accumulated profit at that particular point of time? So if there is any accumulated profit, so whatever the amount which we are getting from the company, first we will separate that amount which is related to accumulated profit because that will be treated as a dividend. It will be taxable in the hands of shareholder as IFOS income as dividend income. Whatever the remaining amount. So let's say I'm getting 10 lakh rupees from the company out of which 1 lakh is the accumulated profit. 1 lakh would be my deemed dividend. 9 lakh will be considered as the uh, selling price for my shares. So this is section 46, which is very important. First of all, in the hands of company, no capital gain will arise that we will see in section 47 also. So if the company first, uh, okay, let me uh, discuss this note after some time. First of all, let me discuss about the shareholder. So in the hands of shareholder, capital gain will also arise. And if there was any accumulated profit also at the time of liquidation, then dividend income is also taxed as IFOS income. So capital gain will arise as the shares are getting transferred on liquidation. So how you will be computing your capital gain? First of all, you will see whatever the amount which you are receiving from the company. So the market value of the assets which you are receiving, the market value of the assets which you are receiving. So you have to take the market value of the assets which you are receiving from the company. Plus, if there is any cash received also, please, first of all, take that amount and see how much is the part of accumulated profit. Subtract that part because that is a deemed dividend. So you have to subtract deemed dividend under section 222C. This amount would be your IFOS income. So after subtracting this amount, this amount is the selling price of the share. This will, amount will be considered as the selling price of the share. And then you can ca calculate your capital gain. Whatever is was the cost of your shares, you can take it as a cost of acquisition. If this holding period was long term, you can index this also. You can index this cost also. Here you will get your long term or short term capital gain as the case may be. Got it? So this was important. Okay, what was this note? This note was, although it will, because whenever company will transfer their asset to the shareholder, it will not be regarded as capital gain in the hands of company. But let's say practically what company does is first company sell off these assets. First company sell off these assets because it was not practically possible for the company. It is not practically possible for the company that they give assets uh, in a non-monetary form to the shareholders, right? So first of all, they sell these assets and they realize cash. So first of all, if they are selling their assets themselves, then in that case, capital gain, of course, will be arise, uh, will arise in the hands of company because right now they are selling their assets, correct? If they are selling their assets and they are realizing cash, then in that case, capital gain will arise. And once they will give this cash to us, then capital gain will arise in the hands of shareholders. But please remember that point that if there is any accumulated profit, that will be considered as a deemed dividend under taxable under IFOS. Correct? So this was section 46. And let's say uh, this, what is this note here? If uh, let's say company has given us asset, let's say company on liquidation, company has given us land. And thereafter, after some time of two, three, five years, we are selling this land. So this land was received, the land or any capital asset which we have received at the time of liquidation. At that time, capital gain uh, was taxable because then, then you have, at that time you have sold your, you have, it will be assumed that you are selling your shares. But this land which you have received, which you have received, if you are subsequently selling it after four or five years, you are sub subsequently selling it. In that case, capital gain will arise. How? Because you are now selling your land. What will, the, what will be the full value of consideration? Whatever the amount which you are selling it for, that would be the full value of consideration. And what would be the cost of acquisition in this case? Because you have not acquired this land. So the cost of acquisition would be whenever you have received this asset, 
whenever you have received this asset uh, some three four years back whenever you have received it what was the fair market value at the time when you have received this asset that will become your cost of acquisition right so when shareholder further sells their asset which assets which they have received at the time of liquidation now they are selling it this asset after some time two three five ten years then cost of acquisition will be the fair market value of the asset which was at the time of liquidation or distribution okay next section is section 46 a buyback of shares or securities so let's say this buyback what is buyback uh, if i have shares and if i sell these shares capital gain will arise because it will be taxable in my hand because now i am selling my shares or other securities so buyback means if you sell your the shares to the same company who has issued these shares so that same company purchases the, uh, those shares so again the capital gain should arise in my hand the shareholder hand because they are selling this asset they are selling asset they are now selling their shares not to any other person they are selling their assets to the same company right so this we know as buyback in company law we know this as a buyback procedure so capital gain should arise on me but here some private companies some uh unlisted companies who are doing some uh manipulations over here so they came out with an amendment earlier it is not this uh, this year amendment it was earlier amendment so they came out with section 46a and they say that whenever this buyback of shares will happen whenever this buyback of shares will happen in case of unlisted companies then we will not text the shareholder but we will text the company itself we will text the company itself later on this amendment was this scope was extended to all the domestic companies to all the domestic companies so now today if any domestic company do this do such buyback buyback of what buyback of shares just for shares not for all securities just for shares so if today if any domestic company whether it is a private company or it's a listed company also it is now for all if it is a domestic company not for foreign company it is for domestic company if domestic company does such buyback of shares only of shares not other, not other securities only of shares then it will be taxable in the hands of company itself it will be taxable in the hands of company itself at a rate of 20 percent plus surcharge 12 percent plus this the total it comes income tax 20 percent surcharge 12 percent plus this total it comes 23.296 percent right so you can learn in this way income tax 20 percent surcharge on this 20 percent add it and then apply four percent says so total it will come to 23.296 it will be taxable in the hands of company itself it will not be taxable in the hands of shareholder right because now we are taxing in the hands of company so it is exempt in the hands of shareholder under section 1034a you just have to remember that because now we have text in the hands of company now it will not be taxable in the hands of shareholder but if it is not domestic company if the buyback is uh doing uh it's a foreign company which is doing the buyback then in that case normal provisions will apply it will be assumed as if the shareholder is transferring their shares and the company is purchasing if foreign company is purchasing it it is a buyback by the foreign company then it will be taxable in the hands of shareholder normally it will be uh, in the shareholder itself and also if it is by domestic company of other securities other than shares because here only shares is there right in case of shares domestic company then it is taxable in the hands of company but if it is other securities in other cases other cases could be buyback of securities by the domestic company other than shares or buyback of if it is shares and if, if it is foreign company also then it will come in other cases right so in other cases there is no issue it will be taxable in the hands of shareholder itself so capital gain will arise in the hands of shareholder or security holder right so this is you should know if the buyback is happening and if it is of shares and it is by domestic company then it will be taxable in the hands of company now all companies are covered whether they are listed or they are unlisted initially it was for unlisted but uh, later on it was uh, uh given to uh, this uh, the scope of the section was extended to uh, uh, all the companies domestic companies also okay then we have section 47 section 47 is about this is section 47 is quite a long section and it is very important as well there are certain points where section 47 says there are certain transactions which are not regarded as transfer there are points which you will see in this section if these transactions are happening we will see that the capital asset is getting transferred from one person to another person it is changing hands but still we will not consider this as a transfer and if we are not considering this as a transfer then capital gain will not arise then capital gain will not arise okay so what are these points over here so we have to do these points here these points all these points these 14 points i have mentioned it here 
these are not be regarded as transfer these will not be regarded as transfer okay so what are these first of all we have already covered in the section 46 i've already told you say if there is a shareholder and at the time of liquidation if they are uh, giving these shares to the company and in turn company are giving their assets to the shareholder then we will be uh, going to take in the hands of shareholder only not in the hands of company it will not be regarded as transfer in the hands of company so it will be only be treated as one transaction as if shares holders is transferring their shares not not for the company so this is duly covered under section 47 so 47 has already made it clear distribution of capital assets by a company to its shareholder on liquidation please do not make it taxable in the hands of company only make it taxable in the hands of shareholder and you know how you will going to tax it if there is any accumulated profit it will be considered as uh, their ifos income deemed dividend income and um, after that after subtracting that deemed dividend it will be considered as the selling price of the shares and you can compute the capital gain that we have discussed in section 46 recently okay Second point says that if you transfer your capital asset by way of gift, will or inheritance, then it will not be regarded as transfer in the hands of transferer, right? The one who is giving this asset by way of gift, will or inheritance, right? So let's say if I have a capital asset, let's say I have a, a piece of land and if I transfer this piece of land to any of my relative, let's say I give this land to my father, mother, spouse, so it will not be because I'm not getting benefit out of it. So in this case, it will not be regarded as a transfer. And even if I transfer this asset to my non-relative, let's say I give this asset to one of my friend. In that case also, capital gain will not arise in my hand. Because who is getting benefit? The person who is receiving it actually getting benefit, right? So in that case, it could be taxable in the hands of receiver, but not in the hands of transferer. So if I give this capital asset by way of gift, will or inheritance, to any of the person, to related party or to any other unrelated person also, capital gain will not arise in the hands of transferer, first of all, right? In the hands of receiver, what will happen? In the hands of receiver, we will see in the IFOS chapter. If they are relative, if they are relative, then in that case, it is exempt. In that case, it is exempt. So let's say if I transfer this capital asset to my related person, let's say to my father, mother or to my um, children or to my spouse, in that case, it will not be regarded as transfer in their hand because they are considered as relative. That we will see in our um, IFOS chapter also. But what if if I'll transfer this capital asset to my friend? In my hand, it will not be regarded as uh, capital gain because I am not transferring it. Because the person who is receiving it, my friend, it will be taxable in their hand as IFOS income. Correct? Okay. So if I am transferring this asset, to my related person, it will not be taxable when received. So when received, it will not be taxable. But to unrelated person, if I am transferring, it will be taxable as IFOS. Now, the question comes over here. There is a case of Manjula Jesha also, which you should know. If let's say a person has transferred their asset to their son or daughter or to any other related person, there would be no implication. There would be no tax implication because that person, it will not, there will be no tax implication in my hand because I'm a transferer. I'll be duly covered under section 47. There will be, there will be no tax implication in the hands of receiver also, because in that case, IFS will say that you have received it from your related person. It will be exempt in that case. There will be no tax implications. But whenever this person, whenever this, my related person will sell this asset, whenever this they will actually sell this asset, then capital gain will arise. Whatever is the selling price, that will be the full value of consideration. And what will be the cost? What will be taken as the cost? Sir, zero because they have not paid anything. But their previous owner, here the concept of previous owner will come into picture. This is very important. When we will uh, bring this concept of previous owner into picture. So the thumb rule is, I'm giving you a simple thumb rule. The, the thumb rule is that whenever this asset was transferred to someone, was there any tax implications or not? You just have to see, was there any tax implications or not? See, if I have transferred this asset to my related person, there, was, there will be no tax implications, right? There would be no tax in my hand also. Section 47 says transfer in the hands of transfer, there would be no capital gain. In the hands of receiver also, IFOS will say it is exempt. So there was no tax implication. The thumb rule is that if there is no tax implication, please bring the concept of previous owner. In that case, you have to take the cost. Whenever this 
related person will sell this asset the cost will be taken uh, will be of the previous owner and the holding period will also be included and this is the case of manjula jesha you can add the holding period of the previous owner also but if there were tax implications if there were tax implication whenever the asset was transferred in that case previous owner concept will not apply please don't bring this previous owner concept over there so let's say if i have transferred this asset if i have transferred this asset by way of gift will or inheritance to my non related person let's say to my friend i have given it to my friend was there any tax implication the answer is yes there was tax implication in the hands of receiver it has become iofos income right so whenever this person will sell this asset my friend whenever this my friend will sell this asset then capital gain will arise and what will be the cost for him sir zero no because he has already paid the tax when he has received it so in that case the cost would be the cost would be the market value uh, or if it is uh, immovable property the stamp value when this person has received the asset right whenever he has received the asset because on that particular thing he has already paid the tax under ifos earlier right so in that case if i am giving this asset to my related person there was no tax implication whenever this related person will sell this asset please bring the concept of previous owner correct previous owner cost previous owner holding period will be added but if but if on the other hand i am selling this i am uh, giving this asset as a gift to my non related person let's say to my friend and it will be taxable in the hands of friend tax implication is there whenever he will further sell it then capital gain will arise in hand in this his hands and what will be the cost the cost which were the fair market value which uh, they have received at the time when this asset was received or if it is uh, immovable asset then we have to take the stamp value that we will see in our ifo sector also okay in that case previous owner concept will not apply correct holding period in that case if i have given it to my friend whether he has to include the holding period of um, my, my holding period also the answer is no in that case previous owner concept will not apply so at the time of if i have given it to my related person so at the time of subsequent sale cost of previous owner will be taken previous owner concept will come over here because there was no tax implication and period of holding you have to include the period of holding of the previous owner also that was case of manjula jesha but if i have given this amount this if i have given transfer this asset to my non related person to my non related person in that case there was tax implication ifos income will arise so previous owner concept will not apply over here whenever they will sell this asset the cost of acquisition will be the fair market value or if it is uh, the case of immovable property then it will be the step value as the case may be that you will get to know in um, the chapter of ifos correct and the holding period of previous owner shall not be included in this case in this case it will not be included because there will be no concept of previous owner got it okay so what we are doing we are doing section 47 there are certain transactions there are certain transactions which are not regarded as transfer which are not regarded as transfer okay let me give you the third point if there is any pa partition of huf which is happening if there is an huf it has some uh, members in huf and if the property of huf is getting partition or the huf is getting partition whether it is a full partition or a partial partition it's a complete partition or some of the member is uh, getting uh, he says that uh, i want a partition i want my share so if the huf is distributing their capital assets to its members on partial partition or full partition then capital gain will not arise then capital gain will not arise and in the hands of receiver also because they have received it from their huf capital uh, there will be no tax implication whenever this person will sell it subsequently then you understand previous owner concept will come in why because there was no tax implication whenever this person has received this asset so the third point is that whenever the capital assets are transferred by huf whether it is a full partition or a partial partition doesn't matter capital gain will not arise next is if there is any holding company if there is any holding company and they are transferring their capital assets to its subsidiary company we understand when uh, this uh, when a company is called a sub subsidiary company so one of the main point is there that if we holds more than 50% of the shares there are other conditions also but one of the most important is when we hold 50 more than 50% of the shares of that company it becomes our subsidiary company but if we 
if if that is our hundred percent subsidiary. Hundred percent subsidiary means that if we hold their entire share capital, so it is nothing but it's our company, right? So if I am transferring my capital assets to my company, it's the child. It's a hundred percent child of that holding company. It's a hundred percent subsidiary of that holding company. Provided that receiver company, the person who is uh, the company which is receiving the asset, it should be an Indian company. So if the holding company, if the holding company is transferring their this, their asset to the subsidiary company, and the subsidiary company, first of all, two conditions are there. First condition, this subsidiary company should be a hundred percent subsidiary company. It means that the entire share capital of the subsidiary company is hold uh, is by hold by the holding company. Second thing is that it's should be an Indian company. It should be an Indian company. If we will transfer any asset to the subsidiary company, then there will be no capital gain in the hands of holding company. And in subsidiary hands also, there would be no implication because subsidiary is 100% child of whom? Of holding company. Whenever this asset will be transferred by the subsidiary company, of course, the same provision will apply. Whatever is the selling price, that would be the full value of consideration, cost of, of which of the previous owner holding company cost will arise over here. Can a subsidiary company also transfer the asset to the holding company? Yes. If such subsidiary company transfer asset to the holding company also, in that case, if the subsidiary is a 100% holding and the receiver must be the Indian company. So here the receiver is holding. So this must be an Indian company. If subsidiary transfer the asset to a holding company, which is its 100% holding, correct? And this now the receiver is an Indian company, then also capital gain will arise, no, will not arise. Okay, so examiner, uh, if they will uh, test you that they will say that it's our holding company where we were uh, holding 99% of the shares. So will it amount to transfer? Then yes, it will amount to transfer. It should be 100%, not 99%, it should be 100%, right? And the receiver should be an Indian company. Next point is that if there is an amalgamation which is happening, if there is an amalgamation which is happening, amalgamation is what? A company gets merged into another company or there are two companies which they uh, amalgamate together and they form a new company. So let's say if there is amalgamation which is happening, so what happens is the assets of the amalgamating company, amalgamating company is an old company. So we have uh, amalgamating company. So let me give you an, this example. There is a company A Limited and there is a company B Limited. Let's say they decided to combine together and they form, let's say they are form, forming a new company. This is also one type of amalgamation. They are form, forming a new company C Limited. So all the assets, this, this is called old company. We also say them amalgamating company, you know, amalgamating company. And what's the new company? This is new company. It's also called as amalgamated company, correct? So this is amalgamated. Got it? So what will happen in amalgamation? All the assets of A limited will go to C limited. All the assets of B limited will go to C limited. And C limited is nothing but the combination of A and B, right? So as such, nothing more is happening. Just the name of the company is getting changed and the, now all the assets will be owned by C limited, which is nothing but A and B uh, all they are some together. They're clubbed together, right? So in this case also, if amalgamation is happening and the amalgamating company, it could also be like this, that A limited is getting amalgamated into Z limited. It can also form in that this way also, right? So whatever the, all the assets which are getting transferred to an amalgamated company also, Provided the receiver should be an Indian company. If this is an Indian company, then the tr all the assets which are getting transferred, there would be no capital gain in the hands of amalgamating company. There would be no capital gain in the hands of amalgamating company. There would be no tax implication in the hands of amalgamated company also. It's same like that we are transferring this asset to the uh, to our related person. It's same like uh, that scenario. So whenever this asset will be transferred by them, if subsequently they will sell this asset, then of course capital gain will arise and the holding period of this also and this also would be included, correct? And the uh, cost of acquisition will be taken as of the previous owner. The previous owner concept will arise over here, right? What was the thumb rule? If there was tax implication at the time when they have received it, if there was tax implication, then previous owner concept will not pitch in. But if there is tax, there if there is no tax implications, 
then we can bring the previous owner concepts over here. So there was no tax implication. There was no, it was not regarded as transferred in the hands of amalgamating company also. And amalgamated company also will not be subject to any tax in that case, right? If assets are transferred. Okay. And uh, the same way, provided this amalgamated company should be an Indian company. So this is written over here, transfer of capital assets by amalgamating company to the Indian amalgamated company, then it will not be regarded as transfer. Same way, if there is a opposite to this, that is demerger. If what is demerger? Demerger is split. So uh, let's say there is a company. Uh, okay. Let's say there is a company Z Limited. Z Limited has four departments. It has four divisions. It has four departments, and it was all under Z Limited. So what they do is what they uh, plan is that now they are splitting one of the department and they are making it as a altogether a separate company so that we, uh, they are split at one of the department one department is spinned off from here and it is known as now r limited and other three departments remain still with z limited so this will be z limited so the new company which is formed, they have just splitted one of the department over here and they formed all together a new company. So this is called a resulting company. This is called a resulting company. And the company which uh, still there is called a demerged company. So Z limited is a demerged company. Right. So what they will do if they would like to make it a separate company, they will transfer some assets to this company, right? Whatever the, uh, let's say I have already mentioned you, let's say it has four departments. So whatever the assets belonging to this department, they will transfer it over here. So in this case, if there is a demerger which is happening and if they are transferring this asset to the resulting company and if this resulting company is an Indian company, if this resulting company is an Indian company, in that case also, this transfer will not be regarded as a this transaction will not be regarded as a transfer and no capital gain will rise and whenever this resulting company and what would be the tax implication in the hands of resulting company nothing we have just simply have just split this particular department otherwise there is no major changes which has happened there is just a company with a new name which has come into picture otherwise there is no but all the, this r limited is also owned by the shareholders of z limited right now whenever the assets will be transferred there will be no tax implication but if subsequently r limited will transfer the asset then capital gain will of course arise and the previous owner concept will pitch in then uh, the holding period this and holding period this also would be included and the previous owner cost will be taken as the cost of acquisition correct so transfer of capital assets by the demerged company to the indian resulting company to the indian resulting company capital gain will not arise and of course the previous owner concept will arise whenever this uh, resulting company will sell these assets they will transfer this capital asset subsequently then capital gain will arise and the previous owner concept will come into picture okay next point next point says again i'll tell you with an example Next point says, let's say there is a company which is getting amalgamated. Let's say I am taking an example of uh, Mintra Limited. There is a company Mintra Limited. This is getting amalgamated into Flipkart Limited. So earlier there was a company called Mintra Limited. And now they are getting amalgamated into Flipkart. So let's say there was one of the shareholders, there were some shareholders of Mintra Limited. Let's say there was a person, Mr. A. He has purchased, long time back, he has purchased shares of Mintra Limited. At that time, there was no amalgamation. Mintra Limited was a separate company, Flipkart was a separate company. But he has purchased the shares of Mintra Limited earlier. So let's say he has purchased uh, 1000 shares of Mintra Limited at a rate of rupees. 100 each okay he has purchased 1000 shares of mantra limited at a rate of rupees 100 each let's say he has purchased them on 1 5 2016 he has purchased now he was holding these shares and he would like to hold this share for a long time he was holding these shares 
but somehow this company now decided this company has decided to amalgamate themselves into flipkart limited okay so uh, the uh, existence of mintra limited will be ceased to exist right it will cease to exist still the brand name is there but the company is flipkart right so uh, uh, mintra limited uh, would be would be ceased to exist what will happen to the shares of mr a he will be given an offer in flipkart so flipkart will ask them whenever this is happening let's say this amalgamation is happening i am giving you a date let's say it is happening on 15th of july 2023 it is happening so flipkart will ask the shareholders of mintra limited that whether you would like to sell those shares now let's say the uh, mintra limited share is now worth rupees 500 whatever it is so flipkart will say they, they will ask the shareholder whether you would like to sell your shares to us so if mr a agrees to this that yes sir i would like to sell my shares i will no longer uh, remain the shareholder of this company now i would like to sell those shares so in that case there will be no problem capital gain will arise that's it right so if this person is selling the shares flipkart will pay him the amount so whatever the amount which he has received that will be the full value of consideration selling price and the cost of acquisition would be this much if it is long term yes it is long term and then you can do the indexation also and what is the uh, holding period for shares if it is listed shares then we know it is after one year it becomes long term indexation will be done and if it is unlisted shares we know we know two years after two years it becomes long term okay so indexation will be done if they are selling these shares but what if if they say no sir i do we don't want to sell the shares you can give us the shares of flipkart limited you can give us the shares of flipkart limited so what flipkart will do is flipkart will issue them the shares of flipkart and they will take the shares of mintra here also the transaction is happening we are giving mintra shares and we are getting flipkart shares will there will be any capital gain the answer is no section 47 has already covered this case also if the shareholders of the amalgamating company this is old company amalgamating company if the shareholders of amalgamating company are getting the shares of amalgamated company then we will not consider is a transfer whenever these shares will be sold subsequently then capital gain will of course arise but at the time when this they they will get the shares of new company then there will be no transfer let's say so how much shares they, they will get it will be decided on the swap ratio whatever is the swap ratio let's say swap ratio is one is to one let's say uh, one is to one so let's say the flipkart value on this date the share value on this date because examiner will confuse you will try to confuse you they will say that the uh, flipkart value on this date is rupees uh 900 per share 900 per share see so some students will get confused they will say sir we have purchased it for 100 now we are getting the value of 900 and let's say the ratio is one is to one so you will get 1000 shares which is the market value is 900 the market value of the share is 900 but tell me why you are getting a swap ratio of 1 is to 1 why because right now the mintra share would also have rupees somewhere about 900 that is the reason the swap ratio is 1 is to 1 correct so in this case so in this case there would be no capital gain please don't get confused here if simply uh, the examiner will give you the market value don't get confused whatever is the market value 900 1900 9000 we don't care there would be no capital gain there would be no tax implication as of now whenever these shares will be converted whatever is the swap ratio one is to one one is to two one is to three whatever is the swap ratio there would be no capital gain in this case but yes whenever they will be sold let's say the swap ratio is one is to one so he will get 1000 shares right say so what you will do is of market value you it is of no use you will not do anything of this market value and there would be no tax implication in your head but yes once you will be transferring these shares now you have got the flipkart share let's say after some time you are transferring this share let's say on uh, 1st of december 2023 you decided that i am going to transfer this share i am going to sell these shares now you are selling which shares you are selling shares of flipkart right let's say the share uh, selling price is uh, let's say uh, rupees 950 you are selling these 1000 shares of rupees 950 each so 950 would be uh, i'm taking the share uh, value of one share right so this would be the, your full value of consideration of 950 <coughs> i'm so sorry minus cost of acquisition cost of acquisition. first of all tell me it's the short term or a long term gain 
because if I'll count from 15th July 23 till 1st December 23, you will say it is short term. So should I take it short term or should I include this period also? We have to include this period also. What is the thumb rule? There was a no tax implication when we have received. So that is the reason we have to include this period also. So it would be a long term capital. It would be a long term capital gain and the cost will be taken of the original shares. What, what was those of Mintra share? So it, the ratio was one is to one. So for one share, you can take, you are selling one share of, let's say 950, you can take the cost of one share, how much it is? 100 rupees. So 100 rupees and it is long term, you have to index this amount also, right? This is how you will calculate. You can multiply it with the number of shares. If say for every, let's say for every uh, one share of Flipkart, you are getting shares of uh, the exchange ratio is not one is to one. The swap ratio is not one is to one. Uh, the swap ratio is one is to two. One is to two means you are getting one flip card share for every two shares of Mitra. So in that case, if you are getting the swap ratio is one is to two, that means you are getting one flip card share, flip card share for every two shares of Mitra, two shares of Mitra. Okay. Then also how much shares you will get? No problem, sir. For every two shares, we will be getting one share. So this, it means the swap ratio is one upon two. So one by two into 1000, you will get 500 shares. Okay. Now you have 500 shares of Flipkart, right? Because the one, because the swap ratio was one is to two. Let's say at that time, the Flipkart value was 900, but Mintra value might be at that time would be somewhere about 450. So that is the reason the management has decided that the swap ratio would be one is to two. Okay, no problem. So now you have 500 shares. Now you will, you are selling, subsequently you are selling. So what will happen? Nothing will happen. When, whenever this amalgamation is happening and you are getting the shares of a new company, amalgamated company, there will be no capital gain. But whenever you will sell the share, there would be a capital gain. And how you will calculate it? Let's say you are now selling this share after some time, two, three months, you are selling this share for rupees, let's say 950. I'm again taking the same value. You are selling it for 950. Okay. 950 is the selling price. Full value of consideration is 950. How much is the cost? How much is the cost of acquisition? Of course, you will do the indexation also. That, that is not an issue. If it is a long term, first of all, holding period would be this also and this also. It would be included. Cost of acquisition would be because this is the value of one share of Flipkart and one share of Flipkart is equal to two shares of Mintra. So the cost would be taken as 100 or 200. It would be taken as the cost of two shares because one share of Flipkart is equal to two shares of Mintra. And this is the, if the selling price is of one share of Flipkart, you have to take the cost of two shares of Mintra, correct? So this is, some, uh, I think, logical, very much logical. So you have to take the cost of two shares. So 200 would be the cost of two shares and you have to index that value also. And you can multiply it with the number of shares which you are getting, uh, which you are selling it, correct? So this was mentioned over here in section 47. This is the seventh point. Transfer of shares by a shareholder. If the shareholder transfers, so here Mr. A was transferring their share in the scheme of amalgamation, in the consideration of shares of amalgamated company, because what is he getting in consideration? He's giving Mintra shares and this person is getting Flipkart shares in consideration. Then in that case, also capital gain will not arise, provided the company, the new company is an Indian company. And important note, whenever the shares of the amalgamated company would be sold, I have already discussed it to you. You have to take the cost of acquisition of the original amalgamating company and if it is one is to one ratio you can take the cost of one for every one share sold you can take the cost of one share and if the swap ratio was different please take it accordingly similarly if there is demerger happening if demerger is happening so you will get the shares of resulting company also in that case there also would be no capital gain which will arise at the time of demerger also let's say i give you this example as well Let's say there is a company, I take that exam, uh, that name Z Limited was the company. And let's say it is getting demerged. Now they are forming one more company as R Limited. R Limited is a resulting company. Resulting company. So, and this is now Z Limited. It's the remaining company. It's a demerged company. So let's say uh, they have, what they did is, they have splitted their 25% of their assets. Let's say one fourth of the asset, they have splitted it over here. So 25% of the asset, they have transferred it to the resulting company and 75% of the assets are still with Z limited. So they have four departments. We, I can assume that there were four departments. One department, they have made it as R limited and three fourth department, uh, three uh, out of four departments, three departments are still here, 75%, okay. So let's say before this demerger, 
यू हैव परचेज लेट से हंड्रेड शेयर यू हैव परचेज हंड्रेड शेयर एट रेट ऑफ फोर्टी ईच यू हैव परचेज हंड्रेड शेयर बिफोर दिस डी मेजर यू हैव ऑलरेडी परचेज दिस शेयर सो यू ओन्स हाउ मेनी डिपार्टमेंट यू ओन्स एंटायर जेड लिमिटेड राइट a unit of it i understand 100 shares you own but that is for z limited entirely that is for all four departments so this 40 rupees consists of all four departments correct and if this is getting demerged they are just uh, splitting their 25% of the assets over here and 75% of the assets over here you will say boss i have purchased the entire company right i have purchased the share of the entire company and if it is getting demerged i want the shares of both the companies correct so you will get the shares of both the companies But yes, your cost, whatever your cost was, it would be split it into two parts. Your cost will be split into two parts. It will become twenty five percent will go here and seventy five percent will come here. So your cost, how much will cost your cost of shares will become? It will become seventy five percent of forty. That is thirty rupees. It will become over here. Ten rupees. It will become over here. Still, you have the share which was costing rupees. I am not saying about the market value. I am saying about the cost. Still, you have the share which was costing rupees forty, but now you have a uh, thirty rupees share in Z Limited, the remaining Z Limited that is demerged company, and you have ten rupees share in your R Limited. And how many shares you will get? Hundred each, hundred each, right? Will you get seventy five shares here and twenty five shares here? No, you will get hundred hundred each, but the cost will be uh, seg uh, segregated. It will be splitted. See, if if you would like to uh, reconcile also, hundred shares into forty is how much? Four thousand, right? And here also, thirty into hundred is three thousand over here. Ten into hundred is one thousand over here. Your four thousand would be split into two parts, correct? So I was saying that if there is a person who was holding a shares of Z Limited, but later on the merger happens, then this person will receive the shares of resulting company also. But yes, cost would be split in that case. So whenever this person will get the shares of resulting company, there would be no capital gain. It will not be regarded as a transfer, and there would be no capital gain. There will be no tax implication. But whenever this person, but whenever this person will sell these shares, whenever this person will sell these shares, then of course capital gain will arise. Capital gain will arise. Let's say now he has hundred shares, hundred share, and what will be the cost? What will be taken as the cost? Sir, twenty-five uh, percent was uh, assets was splitted, so we will do twenty-five percent of this cost. It will be ten uh, rupees, and for this it is seventy-five percent. It would be thirty rupees. So if these shares will get sold later on, let's say he has hundred shares. Now he is selling these shares for rupees. Let's say he is now selling it share for rupees fifteen, one five. So full value of consideration is he is selling hundred shares at a rate of fifteen each. Full value of consideration is fifteen. Cost of acquisition would be. Hundred shares into how much? Forty or ten? Ten. It will not take forty. We will take ten over here because forty is the cost for the entire company. But now this company is divided into two parts, so this cost will be thirty. This cost will be ten, right? So it will be taken proportionately as per the assets which were transferred to the resulting company. Correct. So this is the case when you uh, this I have already mentioned over here. This is how you will distribute it. Ninth point is transfer of government securities outside India by a non-resident to another non-resident. Actually, uh, this is related to non-resident concepts. This is not very important for CA intermediate, but still you should know about it. Government needs foreign currency. Government needs foreign currency. So government gives some advantage to the foreigners. They give advantage to the non-residents. They say that non-resident you can invest in our government securities. So uh, we will offer you good. Interest rate will give you good interest rate, but still these people are reluctant. Why? They say that in India the tax rate is very high because these non-residents says that whenever I'll transfer this asset, whenever if I'm sitting in US, if I'm transferring, if I'll transfer this asset to an, another person also in US, you will say that the Indian assets are getting transferred because we understand in section nine we have already discussed that if Indian assets uh, get sold or transferred, then uh, it will be taxable in the. Uh, in the country that is in India, we will going to trans uh, tax it. So here, government of India has given advantage on these securities that if a non-resident purchases a government securities, if we we'll issue a, a government securities in outside India to a non-resident, and if they even transfer the securities anywhere outside India, one from one non-resident to another non-resident, we will not going to tax you. That is the reason we have given you incentives. So here, it is mentioned over here. 
transfer of government securities outside India by a non-resident to another non-resident, it will not attract a capital gain tax. It will not be regarded as transfer. Correct. Tenth is redemption of seven gold bonds issued by RBI in the hands of individual. I was telling you about the seven gold bonds. Seven gold bonds are the bonds which are issued by RBI, which are issued by RBI and they fluctuate. Their value uh, is based on the value of gold. As gold fluctuates, the seven gold value also gets fluctuated. But how it is different from gold deposit bonds? See, gold deposit bonds are not regarded as capital asset. So whenever you will sell gold deposit bond, there would be no capital gain because it is not regarded as capital asset. How it is different from gold deposit bond? In seven gold bonds, RBI says that we will give you rate of interest also. Although rate of interest is not that too high, it is just 2.5% simple interest, but still there is a rate of interest in seven gold bonds. Seven gold bonds are capital assets. Seven gold bonds are capital. Gold deposit bonds are not capital assets, but seven gold bonds are capital assets. So whenever these seven gold bonds are transferable also, it can be traded on stock on exchanges also. And if this seven gold bonds is uh, transferred, it is sold, then capital gain will also arise. But RBI says that we are giving, we are giving a relaxation to individual. We are giving this, uh, this relaxation only to individual, not to partnership firm, not to, not to companies, only and only to individual. That if they will come at redemption, whenever this seven gold bonds will be redeemed by RBI, Generally, the life of these seven gold, gold bonds is generally eight years. It is generally eight years. This is just for your knowledge sake. So whenever these seven gold bonds will be redeemed by us, because we understand that redemption is also a kind of transfer, right? Relinquishment of right, because our will will no longer be the, the bond holder. That is also re, uh, our relinquishment of right. That will also can give rise to the transfer definition, right? So in that case, if they say, if RBI says that if this seven gold bonds will be redeemed by the individual, in that case, we will not charge capital gain, we will not charge capital gain. But yes, if you will, before redemption, if you are selling this asset, because these seven gold bonds are, are transferable also, they can be traded on the exchanges, right? If you will sell that before redemption, then capital gain will arise. But yes, if it is at the time of redemption only, and that too in the hands of individual, not for anyone else, only for individual, only at the time of redemption, only at the time of redemption, right? Come to 11th point. 11th point says that this is amendment. This is important. Please mark it important because this is an amendment. Uh, see, uh, as I have told you earlier also that in India, uh, we are high consumer of gold. Although we are not producer of gold, we are high consumer of gold. So government wants government wants that people should uh, not keep gold with them. They, people should not keep physical gold with them. They should deposit the physical gold with the economy, with, with the government. So they come, came out with gold exchanges, gold exchanges. Now there is a concept where if you have a physical gold, if you have a physical gold, you can come to us. You can come there. There are gold exchanges which, which are open uh, for, for you. And the intermediary in stock exchange, we have an intermediary as stock broker. But in gold exchange, we have an in intermediary as vault, vault manager, vault manager. Right. So you can go to the vault manager and you can submit your physical gold with them. They will issue you a gold deposit receipt. They will uh, issue you a electronic gold deposit receipt which is called as EGR, EGR, Electronic Gold Resets, they can uh, issue you. So what is the advantage of EGR is their value depends upon the gold. As your gold value will fluctuate, their EGR value will also be uh, also fluctuate. And you can trade that EGR in the gold exchange. You can trade that EGR in the gold exchange. Okay. So these EGR are also kind of capital asset because these are kind of securities. These are also capital asset. Whenever you will sell this cap EGR, then capital gain will arise. But in section 47, they say that if you have a physical gold, if you have a physical gold, and once you convert this physical gold into EGR, so uh, where you will go, you will go to the vault manager. You will ask him that this is my gold. He will check your gold and he will give you that amount of EGR. In that case, there would be no capital gain because as of now, there is no 
देर इज नो इनकम इन योर हैंड राइट यू हैव जस्ट कन्वर्टेड योर फिजिकल गुड इन टू ईजी सो इन दैट दैट केस दैट इज कवर्ड अंडर सेक्शन फोर्टी सेवन सो वेन एवर यू विल कन्वर्ट योर फिजिकल गोल्ड इन टू ईजी आर देर वुड बी नो कैपिटल गेन बट येस इफ यू विल सेल दर ईजी आर देन अगेन कैपिटल गेन विल राइज बट ओनली ऑन कन्वर्शन फ्रॉम फिजिकल गोल्ड टू ईजी आर देन कैपिटल गेन विल नॉट अराइज एंड ऑल्सो लेट से I have some gold. I go to vault manager and I say that I would like to open an account over here and I would like to submit my physical gold and he will give me EGR. No capital gain will arise. Now I am holding this EGR. Now I am holding this EGR. Let's say after some time, uh, it comes to my mind. I want my physical gold back. I want my physical gold back. I just went to the vault manager again and I say that sir, please take your EGR now. Give my physical gold back to me. So if I am getting my EGR converted back into gold. Then again, there would be no capital gain. So whenever this conversion is happening, if you are converting your physical gold into EGR, or you are converting your EGR into physical gold, then this both are covered under section forty-seven. But yes, tell me, what what if there is no concept of EGR? What if if you just sell your physical gold, capital gain will arise? What if if you sell your EGR, capital gain will arise? But on this conversion. Whenever this EGR is converted into physical gold or physical gold is converted into EGR, there would be no capital gain, right? Okay, so this is all uh, written over here. And also tell me, let's say, tell me. I think you can, you will be able to give this answer. There is no problem as such. Let's say Mr. A has physical gold. Let's say Mr. A has physical gold, which he has purchased. For rupees five lakh, this was his purchase cost. He has purchased physical gold for rupees five lakh, and after some time, he goes to the vault manager. He goes to the vault manager, and he says to him that, sir, I would like to convert my physical gold into EGR. Okay, he converted that physical gold into EGR. Here, the conversion is getting placed. There would be no capital gain. There would be no capital gain. Let's say Mr. A sold this EGR later. He now has EGR. Now he is selling this EGR. Capital gain will arise. He is now selling this EGR. Let's say of rupees seven lakh. Tell me how much would be the capital gain? Sir, two lakh. Simple. So how you have calculated this two lakh? Sir, seven minus five. Even a small kid can calculate this. But how you have calculated the cost of acquisition? Because what are you selling? You are selling EGR, right? So you are selling EGR. What is EGR? Electronic gold asset. So the full value of consideration is. Seven lakh. You are selling it for rupees seven lakh, and the cost of acquisition. The cost of acquisition was EGR was nil. No sir, it was the cost of acquisition. We have to take off the gold, right? So you have to take the cost of acquisition of the physical gold. So the cost of acquisition was five lakh. So which cost you have taken of the gold you have taken? Okay. So this is five lakh, and this would be two lakh would be your capital gain. This two lakh would be capital gain in the hands of Mr. A. Mr. A has two lakh rupees capital gain. Okay. So what he has sold EGR. Let's say, okay, I will give you some more points over here. Let's say he, this gold, this EGR now EGR is sold by A to Mr. B. So Mr. B has purchased for Mr. B seven lakh is the cost price of EGR. What he has purchased EGR, right? Now after some time B is selling this EGR for rupees uh, eight lakh to C. He has sold this EGR. See, first it was physical gold. Physical gold converted into EGR by A. A sold this EGR. He is is now he is not converting. He is selling his EGR. Capital gain will arise. Two lakh will arise in the hands of Mr. A. Correct. Mr. B has EGR now. Mr. B has purchased this EGR for seven lakh. Now he is selling this EGR to C for rupees eight lakh in the hands of Mr. B. He is selling securities, right? So in the hands of Mr. B, one lakh would be the capital gain. So B would also be taxable, and one lakh would be the capital gain. It would be exempt. No, exemption section forty-seven applies only when conversion happens, right? So it will come to EGR is now with C, and what is the cost of EGR? Sir, eight lakh for C. For C, it is eight lakh because he has purchased EGR for eight lakh. Now can. C can go to the vault manager and can it can be converted into physical gold? Answer is yes. Any time your EGR can be converted into physical gold. 
So what C says is C is now holding EGR, but he says now I would like to reconvert this into physical gold. He can go and reconvert this also. Now this EGR is getting converted into physical gold. This is duly covered under section 47. There would be no capital gain in the hands of C because C has purchased the EGR for 8 lakh. He's right now he's not selling this EGR. He's just converting this EGR into physical gold. There would be no capital gain in the hands of C. Now C has gold, right? Now, now C has gold. Now C is selling his physical gold. Now he C is selling it this physical gold for 8.5 lakh. Capital gain will arise. Now he's selling the physical gold, right? On conversion, there would be no uh, capital gain. It is covered under 47. But now he's selling its physical gold for how much? 8.5 lakh. And how much it would be the cost of this gold? Sir, he has not purchased the gold, but he has purchased the EGR. And EGR cost would be was 8 lakh. So 8 lakh would become his cost of acquisition. It would be deemed as the cost is of gold of 8 lakh. 50,000 would be the capital gain in the hands of C whenever this gold would be sold, right? But on conversion, when A has converted this from gold to EGR and when C has converted this EGR into gold, this transaction has not regarded as transfer. Getting it? Okay. Everything is written over here. This is what it is written over here. You can read this. Okay. Twelfth point. C, we know that whenever this, uh, these expensive paintings, drawings, sculptures, whenever these are sold, whenever these are sold, we understand that these are considered as a capital asset and capital gain will arise. But, 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 whenever these paintings, drawing, archaeological collections, any work of art is sold to the government itself, it's sold to the government or to, or to government museums or it can, we can say national museums, national archives, national uh, universities. So whenever these uh, paintings, drawings, sculptures, any work of art are sold to the government or to government uh, agencies like national museums, national archives. In that case, government has said, okay, we will not charge capital gain on you. But yes, if you sell these paintings to someone else, then capital gain will rise. But if you sell these paintings to government, universities, national museum, national art gallery, national archives, institutions notified by central government, then in that case, capital gain will not rise. Conversion of bonds, if you have convertible bonds, if these convertible bonds get converted into shares, or if uh, you have uh, preference shares, these gets converted into shares, then again, capital gain will not arise. If it is of the same company, right? If it, it should be the same company. If you have debentures, it should be converted into shares of the same company. If it is for another, another company, then capital gain will arise. It should be the same company. Reverse mortgage. You understand what is reverse mortgage? These uh, senior citizens, what happens is if uh, they have no, um, their, their children are not supporting them and they need money. Uh, so they they have their house with them. So uh, this old couple can go to the bank and they will ask the bank that please uh, bank you can keep uh, the papers of my uh, house and in turn you give us money. So whenever this transaction is happening, they are getting this mortgage. They are uh, giving this house to the bank and bank is paying them a lump sum money or bank can also give them a lump sum money and also a, a monthly payment they can also the bank can give it to them. So in that case, there's this a transaction where they are transferring their house to the bank. We will say, no, it will not be regarded as transfer. It will not be regarded as transfer, right? So whenever, uh, let's say if later on they can repay the money, then they, they can get their house back also. How the physical uh, possession of the house remains with the, uh, with these person, uh, with this, uh, this senior citizen or super senior citizen, but yes, uh, the papers of the, uh, of that property remains with the bank. So let's say. After the death of the senior citizens, let's say both the both the husband and wife is, are now expired. So bank will first ask their legal heirs. They will first come to their legal heirs. See, they will say, "See, your parents has uh, given us this uh, uh, this house uh, house papers to us as a as a mortgage. We have given them this much loan, and monthly also we are paying them uh, them that much amount. So this is the amount which you have already paid to your parents, and there's plus." we will charge interest also uh, so we are giving you an opportunity if you would like to repay this amount back to us then you can get your home back to you so if generally a legal heir agrees to it because the value of the house is much more than that so they generally agrees to it so if they get their home back by repaying the amount then nothing there would be no transfer right because they have they are getting their home back but let's say legal heir denies they say no we don't want this house back you can sell this house 
सो नाउ इफ दे आर सेलिंग दिस हाउस दे आर सेलिंग दिस हाउस ऑन हुज बी हाफ ऑन लीगल एड्स बी हाफ सो इफ द बैंक इज सेलिंग दिस हाउस then capital gain will rise in that case when the bank is actually selling this house and the capital gain will rise in whose hands legal hands right because whatever the amount which they will re realize by selling this this property so they will bank will keep the, their amount whatever they have given the loan plus interest they will keep it with themselves and the remaining amount they will give to their legal heirs so this capital gain will also arise in the hands of legal heirs not in the hands of bank because it this this house belongs to that uh, senior citizen after that it be belongs to the legal heir so it will be taxable in the hands of legal heir right so this was again the last point over here in section 47 this transaction is also not regarded as transfer so this was section 47 we have already done section 48 we have already completed 48 was computation of capital gain how we computed selling price minus cost price selling price is taken as full value of consideration cost price is taken as cost of acquisition cost of improvement or expenses on transfer Okay. Next is first proviso to section forty-eight. Although this proviso is not that important for examination, but you never know whatever uh, whenever uh, the examiner might ask. So we have to do all these things. No need to remember the section number. You should know the provision. So this provision is applicable only for non-residents or for foreign companies because you understand India needs foreign currency. India needs foreign investment should flow into India. so we have to give some extra advantage to these non residents or to foreign companies so these people are of the view okay sir we will invest in india but whenever you will be computing capital gain it will be in indian currency because our currency is bit stronger they are of the view that their currency are bit stronger yes obviously uh, dollars and euros are stronger compared to indian rupees so these guys are saying that our currency is stronger so we want that whenever you will be cal calculating your capital gain please calculate that in foreign currency do not calculate that in indian currency so whatever the components which we use so how capital gain is computed selling price minus cost price selling price is the uh, full value of consideration cost price is cost of acquisition cost of improvement expense on transfer so whatever thing you uh, take in calculation please take into foreign currency so afterwards once you determine your capital gain that capital gain can be reconverted into indian currency then we will pay tax so they they want their calculation should be done in foreign currency so that that is the reason first proviso to section 48 is inserted over here it is applicable only to whom only for non resident and foreign companies if they purchase if they purchase shares or debentures of indian company if they purchase shares and debentures of indian company second important thing is that they have purchased these debentures by using their foreign currency they have actually brought the foreign currency from outside india they have purchased indian shares or indian debentures so whenever they will be selling these shares or debentures we have to calculate that as per first proviso to section 48 so it says if it is applicable only to whom non residents and foreign companies second thing shares or debentures of indian companies are purchased and that to in foreign currency they have purchased these shares or debentures in foreign currency correct capital gain shall first be computed in foreign currency you have to compute whatever uh, the components which you used selling price full value of consideration less cost price cost of acquisition expense on transfer cost of improvement is not applicable for shares or debentures correct so cost on improvement we can ignore so cost of acquisition expense on transfer whatever you take please convert that first in foreign currency everything should be computed taken as foreign currency and then the at the last the capital gain which you will get that obviously it will be in foreign currency because all the components we have taken in foreign currency so at last whenever uh, once you get the capital gain then you can reconvert that capital gain into indian currency and then you can pay the taxes so how we will do it this is very simple this is very simple see what is the method of computation same it will remain same just we have to convert that indian rupees into foreign currency we will take full value of consideration but that in foreign currency less expenses on transfer net consideration we will get expenses on transfer should be taken in foreign currency correct same thing it's same thing just we have to take everything in foreign currency once net consideration you will receive you will subtract cost of acquisition cost of improvement cost of improvement would not be applicable for shares and debentures so it is only cost of acquisition so cost of acquisition you have to subtract once you get your capital gain it would be long term or short term depends upon the holding period of that particular share or debenture so whatever capital gain you will get that will be in foreign currency and once you get the capital gain then you can reconvert that into 
Indian rupee so that you can pay your taxes in Indian rupee, right? Now the question is, sir, which rate, which date rate we have to take? Because foreign currency this must have purchased on some date, it has been sold on some another date. So which date we have to take? This is something which is very logical. You don't even have to learn this. This is very logical. See, full value of consideration. What does full value of consideration means? Selling price. So you will take the rate of the selling date whenever he is selling that particular this non-resident or foreign company are selling their shares or debentures. Take the rate of that particular date. Okay. So full value of consideration is nothing but selling price. Take the date of that particular date whenever this uh, shares or debentures are sold. Expense on transfer. Tell me. No, no need to learn anything. Expense on transfer. When are these expenses on transfer are incurred? Expenses on transfer. Whenever we are transferring these shares or debentures. So we are transferring on the sale date. So you have to take the foreign currency of the sale date, right? Less cost of acquisition. Cost of acquisition you have to convert into foreign currency. Tell me. Please apply your logic. Which date you will take? So the cost of acquisition, the date on which we have purchased these shares or debentures, we will take the foreign currency of that particular date whenever they were purchased. So this is simple. Full value of consideration, sale date. Expense on transfer, sale date. Cost of acquisition, purchase date. Simple. Okay. Now we have to, you have to remember that we have to take the sale date. We have to take the rate, but there are actually two rates on that. One is buy rate and one is selling rate. Right. You understand if you would like to uh, if if you have uh, been to the bank, then there are two rates which are mentioned. One is uh, the rate at which they sell the foreign currency at the one rate which they buy the foreign currency. So what we have to take the average of these two rates. So full value of consideration, you should get into foreign currency. So how you will convert that? You will convert by taking the average of buying rate and selling rate. But of which date of the sale dates so that is logical. Okay, expense on transfer, same thing of sale date, which rate average of buying rate, selling rate of that particular date of the date on which you are selling this particular shares or debentures. So you will get your net consideration in foreign currency. Then after that, you have to subtract your cost of acquisition and that should be in foreign currency, which date, sir, the date on which they were purchased, you take the average date, uh, rate of that date, whatever the buying rate was there, it will be all given to you in the question, right? It will be all given to you in the question. What was the a buying rate? What is the selling rate? Okay. So you have to take the average of buying rate and selling rate of that purchase date. So you have to subtract this and you will get your capital gain. It would be short term, long term, depending upon the holding period. Once you get this capital gain, then you have to reconvert this into Indian currency. Obviously, logical. Why? Because we will be paying tax in India. So we have to pay tax in Indian rupees. So this capital gain should be again converted into Indian rupees. So please tell me which date rate you will take, sir, the date on which this capital gain arise, arise which is the, this date on the date on which we are selling these shares or debentures. So this is the date on this date capital gain has arise. So we have to take the rate of that particular date. So please reconvert this by taking the foreign currency of the date on which this capital gain is arising. That is the date on which this shares are or debentures are getting sold. But here you don't have to take the average rate. You just have to take the buying rate here. In all the above cases, we have taken the average rate, the buying rate, selling rate. We have taken the average of that. But once you will get your capital gain, you have to reconvert that into Indian rupees. But once you will be reconverting into Indian rupees, please apply only the buying rate. See here, average of buying and selling, average of buying and selling, average of buying and selling was written. But here, please apply only the buying rate of sale date on such capital gain so that you can get the capital gain in Indian rupee. Correct. Last thing is that that this cost of acquisition, if it is short term, then you have to take the cost of acquisition. If it is long term, sir, we have to index this that, that we know. No. Here, first proviso to section 48 says that if you are calculating in this manner, because we have already given them, uh, we actually give them benefit. First benefit they, we have given is uh, such capital gain are taxable at a rate of 10%. You don't have to learn this. This is for non-resident, but I am telling you such capital gain is taxable at a rate of 10%. We have given them a 10% advantage. We have given them another advantage that we are converting everything in one currency. So we will not give this advantage of indexation to them. So in this case, in this case, this is an exception to this rule that indexation, even if it is long term, then indexation is not allowed. So this is important. Even if it is long term, indexation will be not allowed. 
right so this is how you will calculate this is what the first proviso to section 48 says that if the non-resident or the foreign company are buying shares or debentures of indian company that too they are bringing foreign currency and then they are purchasing such shares or debentures so whenever they will sell these shares we will apply first proviso to section 48 we will apply first proviso to section 48 that is we will make the entire calculation by taking converting into foreign currency and once you get the capital gain long term or short term but you don't have to do the indexation of cost of acquisition right once we get the capital gain we will reconvert that into indian currency but once we will be reconverting back into indian currency we will not take the average rate we will take only the buying rate otherwise on all the above uh, in all the above components you have to take the average rate okay last point is important where section 112a is applicable this proviso will not be applicable what is 112a i'll also discuss it with you but you understand 112a is whenever you uh, sell your equity shares or equity oriented units in uh, stock exchange and this is if it is long term then 112 we say that it is 112a and if it is shares uh, equity shares or equity oriented units here it is it could, could be equity shares so if you are selling this if non residents or this foreign company are selling their shares on stock exchange and if it is long term so 112a would be applicable in case 112a becomes applicable then this proviso will not be applicable i'll explain you again once i'll be discussing 112a with you correct okay so this was first proviso section 49 section 49 uh, guys is very easy in fact i have discussed most of the point of section 49 section 49 is cost of acquisition in certain cases what is the cost of acquisition cost of acquisition is generally the purchase price right if i have purchased the land for rupees let's say 25 lakh so 25 lakh is my cost of acquisition cost of acquisition is generally the purchase price but in some there are some special cases we understand that if someone has let's say uh there is a land which my father has gifted it to me so what cost i, ha I have to take should i take the cost zero no sir if, he, if your relative has given you uh, a capital asset then you have to take the cost of acquisition of the previous owner so these are some special cases we have already discussed it tell me what is the cost of acquisition of an asset in case of amalgamation let's say there was an amalgamating company there was an old company they have purchased an asset let's say they have purchased an asset for rupees 20 lakh and then they have transferred it to the amalgamated company you understand whenever they will transfer to the amalgamated company if all the conditions are satisfied if it is an indian company then there will be no tax implication after that this new company is selling this asset after that this new company is selling this asset tell me what is the uh, whatever is the selling price that would be the full value of consideration what cost we should take sir we have to take the cost of the previous owner that is the old amalgamating company we have to take the cost of that so these things are mentioned in section 49 we have already discussed most of the things right let me read it out for you first says section 49 is cost of acquisition in certain cases cost of acquisition in certain cases capital asset received as a gift or will or by way of inheritance by uh, from a related person or on partition of huf we understand we have to take the cost of acquisition of the previous owner so if it was a partition of huf we have to take the cost of the huf whenever the uh, huf has purchased it so what was the cost and we understand if it is after 1 4 2000 on or after 1 4 2001 we have to take that cost but if it uh, was acquired before 1 4 2001 we have to take the actual cost of fair market value is in 1 4 2001 whichever is higher correct got it no new thing cost of shares received under amalgamation i have given you that example also let's say there was a shareholder who has purchased the shares of mintra and once this amalgamation happened he receives the shares of new company that is flipkart limited so flipkart limited he has not purchased the share but he has got the shares in exchange so whenever he will selling this whenever he will sell this shares of flipkart whenever on any subsequent date once he will be selling these shares of flipkart we will be computing their capital gain and how it will be computed sir whatever is the selling price of the flipkart shares we will take the full value of consideration cost of acquisition would be the shares cost of the mintra shares the old company share correct so this we have already discussed cost of shares received under amalgamation cost of shares of amalgamating company 
what is the this also you understand cost of shares of demerger company so we understand that if there is a demerger which had happened i've already taken the example also then we have to apply that cost on a proportionate basis so whatever is the proportionate assets which are going to the resulting company the assets which are going to the uh, demerged company we have to take the cost accordingly we have to do it in a proportionate basis do you remember that example it was a 40 rupees share and 25 percent of the assets were uh, getting uh, were uh, going to the resulting company so in that case the original cost was 40 so if 25 percent of the assets are going to the resulting company 75 percent are still with demerged company so we have to do it proportionately 40 into 25 percent that is 10, 10 rupees cost will become the cost of the resulting share and 30 rupees that is 40 into 75 percent 30 rupees will become the cost of the uh, demerged company right so this you understand i was saying that we have already discussed these all these things what is the cost of acquisition of sweat equity shares you understand what are sweat equity shares sweat equity shares are given by the company to their employees or to their directors and majorly they are either free of cost or at a very concessional price so whenever we receive sweat equity share whenever we receive the sweat equity shares so it becomes our perquisite we understand we have already uh, completed this particular point in the chapter of salary so whenever we receive sweat equity share it becomes our perquisite how it becomes our perquisite whatever is the fair market value whatever is the fair market value on the date of exercise of the option it becomes our perquisite and you can subtract if you have paid anything you can subtract it from that right so while taking that while making that perquisite value please tell me in the salary while making that perquisite value what is the base you were taking you were taking the fair market value you were taking the fair market value of the shares when they were received when the, once you are exercising that option right so to that extent you have already paid the tax in the salary right to that extent you have already paid the tax in salary so now it will become your cost so once you will be selling it now now you, if you are selling those sweat equity shares let's say you have received these sweat equity shares two years back now you are selling these shares so whatever you are selling this share of that amount the selling price will become your full value of consideration and what will be the cost should it should i take zero no because we have already paid some tax in the chapter of salary right in the head, under the head salary we have already paid that tax up to that fair market value right so fair market value will become your cost of acquisition so in this this case the fair market value of the shares when received it becomes your cost of acquisition whatever the fair market value which you have taken while computing per QZ, in the salary it will become your cost here right cost of a capital asset which was earlier used as inventory or stock this is important if you remember pgvp section 28 i'll tell you with an example let's say there is a person mr a let's say mr a is a jeweler mr a is a jeweler he has purchased gold of rupees 10 lakh on 1 5, let's say 2016. He has purchased gold of rupees 10 lakh on 1 5, 2016 and he is a jeweler. Please remember that he is a jeweler. So tell me if he has purchased a gold, is this, is this gold is a capital asset for him or it's a stock in trade? It's a stock in trade, correct? He is a jeweler. He has purchased gold in the course of his business. So it's a stock for him. So we understand that this stock is the purchase price for him. Let's say after some time, after some time, let's say on 31st March 2017, he converts this stock in this year, he converts this stock into his capital asset. He, per he converts this stock into his capital asset see in this lecture we have just discussed we have discussed is that whenever you convert your capital asset into stock and trade then capital gain it gives rise to capital gain right although we make it taxable in the year when it is actually sold but this there would be a capital gain implications right but here reverse thing is happening reverse thing is happening if a person has earlier he was having a stock now he is converting his stock into capital asset right so this is something which is opposite to that we have just learned in this lecture so now if you are converting your stock into your capital asset it is duly covered under section 28 it is duly covered under section 28 section 28 charging section of pgvp says that whenever you will convert your stock into a capital asset then pgvp income will arise and it becomes taxable in that very year in capital gain whenever 
the capital assets get converted into stock when capital assets get converted into stock we don't tax you right we tax you whenever this stock will be sold right? in capital gain we wait but pgvp is quite naughty he is naughty he says no i'll not wait you have to make it taxable right here you have to make it taxable right here whenever you are converting this stock into capital asset so section 28 will be attracted so in this year itself it will become taxable how whatever is the fair market value on this date let's say the fair market value of this gold it was purchased in may 2016 let's say in march 2017 this fair market value comes to rupees 12 lakh so we'll make it taxable here itself so how we'll make it taxable this is easy so whenever this guy has purchased this 10 lakh rupees of stock it must have hit in his pnl account as purchases correct purchase because he's what what he's purchasing he's purchasing a stock so it will reflect as purchases 10 lakh and whenever he will be converting this stock into this is something which is related to pgvp correct so whenever he will be converting his stock into capital asset we will say by it is regarded as a deemed sale it is regarded as a deemed sale pgvp section 28 will be attracted we will say it is a deemed sale and uh, what would be the full full value of consideration whatever is the fair market value whatever is the fair market value on the day down conversion it will become a deemed sale so 2 lakh will be tax over here we will say that 2 lakh is your profit it will be tax in that very year whenever you will be converting it correct okay so we have already made 2 lakh taxable now you have a capital asset this person has converted this stock into capital asset. now it is a capital asset now he is holding this capital asset from 31st march 2017 and later now he is selling this asset now he is selling this capital asset now what he is selling this guy is selling his cap is he selling his stock or now it is a capital asset now it is a capital asset so let's say in previous year 23 24 he is selling this gold let's say for rupees 28 lakh he is selling this gold for 28 lakh so full value of consideration would be now capital gain will arise whenever he is selling this gold full value of consideration will be 28 lakh what would be the cost of acquisition or index cost of acquisition as the case may be what cost we have to take should we take it 10 lakh no sir till this amount till this till here we have already paid the tax so this capital asset comes to picture in at this particular point of time so whatever is the fair market value whatever is the fair market value 12 lakh will become this cost and if this period is long term it is if it is more than three years then you have to index this 12 lakh also correct so this is written over here cost of capital asset which was earlier used as inventory which was earlier used as inventory so in this case he is selling gold which was earlier used as inventory so whenever this conversion has happened we understand there would be pgvp implication which has already happened right pgvp is quite naughty he says whenever this will be converted i'm going to tax it right away capital gain says we will wait till this stock is actually sold but pgvp says we will make it taxable right away okay got it so whatever is the cost it would be uh whatever is the fair market value on the date of conversion it will become your cost okay this two points i have already discussed with you cost of egr which was issued to the sac after conversion of physical gold we understand that if you are selling your egr if you have converted your physical gold into egr now you are selling your egr so what would be the uh, capital gain will arise because now you are converting physical gold into egr or it has already been converted once it was converted there would be no capital gain but once you are selling this egr capital gain will arise and the amount for which you are selling this asset uh this egr would be the full value of consideration selling price what would be the cost of this egr actually sir i have not purchased this egr i have converted my physical gold into egr so tell me the cost of physical gold so whatever is the cost of the physical gold that will be the cost price of this egr so if if you are we would like if you are selling your egr capital gain will arise what would be the cost sir because i have not purchased this egr if you would have purchased this egr then there is no problem we can take the cost of egr but if you have converted this physical gold into egr that is the reason now you have egr so we will take whatever the cost of your gold was that will become the cost of this egr and vice versa also let's say now the person is selling physical gold now the person is selling physical gold we will ask them whatever the amount which you are selling that will become your selling price okay what is the cost sir the cost which physical gold is purchased that will become the cost simple but he says sir no sir i have not purchased gold actually i have purchased egr then i went to uh, the vault uh, the vault manager and i just 
चेंज दिस EGR into physical gold. Now I have received physical gold. Okay, and now I am selling physical gold. If you are selling physical gold, capital gain will arise. Okay, what would be the cost in this case, sir? The cost would be the EGR because when these EGR were converted into physical gold, what was the cost of your EGR? It will become your deemed value. Logical. Then no need to learn anything, right? So cost of gold, which is received by conversion of EGR. So cost of gold, if you are selling it. so gold would be the that that would be the selling price and the cost was egr you have to take the cost of egr correct simple i i believe that you got it you can relate this with the example which i have just given you in section 47 okay so this was section 49 that is cost of acquisition in certain cases i was telling you that most of the things we have already completed i was i have just read this section with you okay now come to Section fifty. Section fifty is capital gain in case of depreciable asset. Guys, if I tell you, we have already done this section. When in PGBP in section thirty two, thirty two is nothing but section fifty is in fact is nothing but it is part of section thirty two that is depreciation. So if you section fifty applies whenever you sell your depreciable assets on which you charge depreciation block wise. That is thirty two we have we charge depreciation block wise. So section fifty is nothing but fifty two. Uh, sorry, fifty. Uh, if I tell you, please tell me. Let's say a CC. There is an a CC who is running his business. So Mr. A is an a CC. He is running his business. He is a business of making cloth. So cloth is stock in trade. Cloth is stock in trade for him. But he has some. He is a he has a big factory and he has so many machines also by which he use for making clothes. Tell me, he has machines also. He has machine one. He has machine two. Machine three. First of all, tell me these machines are capital assets or not? First of all, tell me these machines are capital assets. The answer is yes, sir. No, sir. It, these are stock in trade. No, boss. Stock in trade is cloth. Stock in trade is cloth. These machines are his capital assets, sir. These are movable, boss. This is not personal, right? We understand. If it would have been personal movable assets, then we can say no, it is not a capital asset. But this is not this. I understand this is movable, but this is not personal. So these are hundred percent capital asset. These are capital assets. And let's say if he is selling this M three, if he is selling this M three, then obviously he is transferring his capital asset. Then capital gain should arise. Correct. So we are discussing, sir, if you sell your depreciable asset. on which you claim depreciation on wdv method that is by uh, using your block then how we will compute your depreciation so this is covered under section 50 and i am telling you this is nothing new this is nothing new section 32 will give you the answer section 32 itself will give you the answer let me recall that for you okay so let's say he has three machines m1 m2 m3 in this previous year this was previous year 23 24 right our previous year and this is a block of uh, let's say this is a block of plant and machinery with 15% rate of depreciation and how do we uh, do this cal uh, this calculation sir so first of all we take the opening value of the block so wdv of the block wdv of the block at the beginning of the year this is nothing this is same thing which i am writing which which we have already discussed in the pgvp revision section 32 so wdv of the block at the beginning of the year how much machines were there m1 m2 and m3 right tell me uh, let's say the total value of this machine these all these machines the value of the opening value was let's say i am taking at a very random figure let's say it was rupees 10 lakh okay okay uh, then what we uh, used to do is if there is any additions during the year we have to add that in this block itself let's say there is any additions during the year additions during the year or acquisitions during the year Let's say we have purchased M four also. In this year, we have purchased M four also, and that this is for four lakh rupees. Okay. Now we'll subtract less money received on sale or disposal. So this is what we have we used to do in section thirty two. Now why I am writing money received because now we are selling this M three. Now we are selling this M three. Sir, M three is a capital asset. We are selling it. Capital gain will also rise. Section fifty will say, okay. So how much 
for how much you are selling this asset. Let's say I'm taking a case that we are selling this asset for rupees. Let's say I'm selling it this asset for rupees 8 lakh. Okay. We are selling a machine M3 for rupees 8 lakh. So how we used to do in uh, section 32? Money received on sale or disposal, how much? 8 lakh. Okay. We have to subtract this. So this is 10 plus 4 minus 8. So this is 14 minus 8 is 6 lakh rupees. Tell me what it is. Tell me what this is. 6 lakh rupees is what it is. So this is WDV at the end for charging depreciation. Do, do we have block? Do we have physical assets over here? Yes, sir. We have M1. Still we have M2. We have an M4. We have. We have block also, physical block also. And we have the value also. So we used to say this as WDV at the end for charging depreciation and you have to charge depreciation of 6 lakh there would be no treatment of capital gain here there would be no treatment of capital gain 6 lakh with the value which you have received this is the block value we have the physical block we have the value also you have to charge depreciation and how do you will charge depreciation first of all remember that section th uh, 32 first of all we'll ask that if it has a new machine yes it has a new machine which was purchased during the year m4 tell me m4 whether it is used during the year answer is yes whether, whether it is used for uh, less than 180 days or, or not. So if it is less, then we will charge half depreciation. If it is more, then we will charge full depreciation. And on the remaining 2 lakh, we will charge full depreciation, right? This is what we have done in depreciation. Sir, we have sold M3. So how it will affect capital gain? It will not affect here. Just my block value will be decreased. Nothing will happen. So nothing will happen. Let's say I have sold this m3 not of 8 lakh let's say i am now selling it for rupees uh how much should i take let me uh, take it for 17 lakh i am now selling it for rupees 17 lakh then what will happen here capital gain might arise so if you are selling it for 17 lakh let's say the opening value of m1 m2 m3 the opening value was 10 lakh you have purchased another m4 for rupees 4 lakh now you are selling it for 17 lakh now you are selling it for 17 lakh Tell me what will happen. Sir, my block value was 10. We have already, uh, we have also spent it 4 lakh rupees on this block. So my total block value is 14. Now your block value is 14. You have already spent it 14 lakh rupees. Now you are receiving, how much you are receiving? 17 lakh. So there is a surplus of 3 lakh. There is a surplus of 3 lakh. Can you charge depreciation? The answer is no. Although there are physical assets, I understand there are physical assets M1, M2 and M4. There are physical assets in the block. But you cannot claim depreciation. Why? Because whatever the amount you have spent it, you have already recovered it. In fact, you are recovering it more. There is a surplus right now. So you cannot uh, say that we, we can charge depreciation. So can you charge depreciation in this case? The answer is no. What is the WDV at the end for charging depreciation? The answer is no. So there is no WDV. Although there are assets and we understand that this is the case which we call is that which we call as block exist but at nil value block do, does exist m1 m2 and m4 we have block exist but at nil value we cannot charge depreciation and here there is a surplus how much 3 lakh so 3 lakh is your surplus this is now capital gain chargeable under section 50 this is section 50 so this is capital gain and it is always short term it will always short term if this machine is even of uh, last, we have, we have purchased this M3 for let's say uh, four years back, five years back, ten years back, it will always be short term. Why? Because the amount which from which we are subtracting the 17 minus 10 and 4, this is not old value. These are new value of opening value, right? So we always say whenever this depreciable asset under section 50 is sold, we always say that it will always be short term. It will always be short term. Correct. Let's say, so whenever you sell your asset, which is much more than the block value, whenever you sell your asset, your selling price is such that your block, it exceeds your block value, then only capital gain can arise. One more scenario. If, let's say, you sell your entire block. If you sell your entire block, let's say there were M1, M2, M3 were there and M4 also you have purchased and now you are selling your entire block. All the machines you are now get, uh, selling. So if you are selling your entire block, let's say the entire block is getting sold for rupees 3 lakh, just for rupees 3 lakh. So this will be, see, opening value M1, M2, M3 was 10 lakh. Additions during the year M4 you have purchased for 4 lakh. Total block value was 14. And now you are selling the entire block for rupees 
थ्री लाख टेल मी विल देयर बी डब्ल्यू डी वी एट द एंड फॉर चार्जिंग डिप्रिसिएशन सर ऑल दो देर इज सम वैल्यू टेन प्लस फोर इज फोर्टीन माइनस थ्री इट विल बी इलेवन बट इज इट द डब्ल्यू डी वी ऑफ द ब्लॉक द आंसर इज नो देर इज नो ब्लॉक एट ऑल देर इज नो ब्लॉक एट ऑल बिकॉज नाउ देर इज नो फिजिकल ब्लॉक ऑल द मशीन विच वर देयर इन द ब्लॉक आर नाउ सोल्ड सो डब्ल्यू डी वी एट द एंड वुड बी नील and here in this case this this is a case of a loss because you have already spent it 10 plus 4 14 lakh you have spent it but you have just recovered 3 out of it and your entire block is sold so in this case this will be the short term capital gain so how much would be the short term capital gain 11 lakh stcl short term capital gain sir if this machine was 5 years old 7 years old 8 years old irrelevant it will always be short term so this is section 50 and this is very much similar to section 32 got it okay so this is written over here so capital gain will arise only in two situation if the entire block is sold then capital gain or capital loss might arise or if any of the part of the block is sold but it is sold sold of such a value that it exceeds the price it exceeds the value of the block then in that case capital gain can arise Right, you don't have to remember these cases. You don't have to remember this case. It's just apply your logic. It will automatically come. The answer will automatically come to you. Correct. And such short capital gain will always be short term. Section fifty. Section fifty is related to whenever you sell your depreciable asset, that depreciable asset which is depreciated either individually or you have claimed a deduction individually on that asset. It is not a part of your block. It was not a part of the block. But it was an individual asset. So how um, can it be an individual asset? It can be an asset of a power generating units where you charge your depreciation individually by using SLM method. If you have uh, have a set, if you have uh, are into a business of generation of power, and if you are claiming depreciation on uh, your SLM method where uh, you depreciate on individual asset, if that Asset is getting sold. It will not be covered under Section 50. It will be covered rather in Section 50A. So, what is the difference between 50 and 50A? Is Section 50 is related to that depreciable asset which is a part of your block, which is a part of block of asset. That means there you charge depreciation on WDV method. But here in Section 50A, 50A deals with those assets which are treated individually. It could be your uh, So, uh, power generating business asset where SLM method is used. It could be uh, your uh, scientific business asset where you charge deductions, right? So these it could be that particular asset where you treat them individually. So if you uh, if you are selling these assets which are treated individually, then Section fifty A will be attracted. And you know how you will calculate this. This again we have already discussed in PGBP, but let me discuss it here as well. So let's say. There is the a company. They were engaged in power generating, and they were charging depreciation on SLM basis. So they have an asset. Let's say there this company name was ABC Limited, and they have a machine on which they were charging. They have a machine of rupees ten lakh. They have purchased. This is the purchase price. This is the original cost, and they were charging depreciation on SLM basis. Let's say the uh, amount of depreciation was one lakh per year. One because we understand SLM remains same every year. So uh, the SLM was uh, straight line method of depreciation. It was one lakh rupees per year. Let's say already four years. Let's say already four years have already passed, and now we are selling in fifth year. In fifth year, we are selling this asset. Okay. So whenever this uh, concept of individual assets is there, I always used to draw. Uh, I always draw a number line. So uh, what is the original cost of this asset? Original cost of the asset. This number line you must have remember. I have already discussed with you in PGP revision as well. So original cost was ten lakh. And what is the written down value? Sir, four year depreciation we have already claimed. So every year we used to claim one lakh, one lakh, one lakh each. That is four lakh depreciation was already claimed. So the written down value of this asset right now is depreciation is four lakh one 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 one, and now the WDV is six lakh rupees. Okay, and this is the number line you understand. If you uh, go this way, number keeps on increasing. If you go this way, number keeps on decreasing. So tell me what is the written down value? So the written down value right now is rupees six lakh. The written down value of rupees is rupees six lakh. Tell me. 
if you now if you are now selling this asset if you are now selling this asset let's say if it is more than 6 lakh now you are selling this in the fifth year you are selling this asset let's say if it is more than 6 lakh it is a profit scenario you will uh, earn something so if you are selling this asset anywhere above 6 but up to 10 but up to this original cost you understand this will be profit but it will be your business profit team business profit under section 41 and we also give it a name balancing charge right so if you are selling this asset for rupees 7 lakh 8 lakh 9 lakh or 10 lakh up till here so this area is your pgbp there would be no capital gain this would be pgbp taxable under section 41 deemed business income do you remember this this is the part of pgbp but if you sell this asset for more than the original cost if you sell this asset for more than the original cost in that case then capital gain will arise and this is nothing but 50a this is section 50a then capital gain will arise so let's say if you are selling this asset for rupees right now the original cost was 10 lakh wdb is 6 lakh let's say now you are selling this asset for rupees 11 lakh you are selling this asset for rupees 11 lakh so you have a profit of 6 uh, 11 minus 6 you have a profit of 5 lakh i can say but from 6 to 10 4 lakh would be your pgvp income under section 41 so if you are selling this asset for rupees 11 lakh if this asset is getting getting sold for 11 lakh so above 6 lakh till original cost this area would be your 5 lakh would be your, sorry 4 lakh would be your pgvp income this is taxable under section 41 okay over and above cost over and above cost would be 58 so how much you are selling it 11 lakh 11 minus 10 1 lakh would be your 58 but please remember if it is a long term asset you have to do the indexation also so if it is short term if it is short term but here it is not short term you are selling it in after four years it will be long term but if would it would have been short term then you can say 11 minus 10 1 lakh would be your capital gain but if it is long term then 11 minus 10 lakh indexation of 10 lakh is the cost you have to do the indexation also CIR of the year of transfer divided by CIR of the year of, of acquisition then you have to do indexation also so this is section 50a so it is applicable on individual assets like power generating units where they charge depreciation on SLM basis it could be scientific research asset also where 100 percent deduction is allowed let's say if this would have been a scientific research uh, asset which is now getting sold directly we were using it earlier as a scientific research now we are directly selling it uh, we have completed using uh, it for scientific research now we are selling this asset then what you will do let's say there is a business they have purchased a machine for rupees 5 lakh for scientific research purpose we understand section 35 says that you can claim 100 percent deduction in the very first year you can claim 100 percent deduction in the very first year okay so tell me uh, if we'll claim 100% reduction, how much would, would be the written down value now? Zero, obviously 100% reduction we have claimed. So if I plot this in the number line, what is the original cost? First of all, if you draw a number line, plot the original cost. The so original cost was 35 lakh, okay? Original cost was 5 lakh. How much is the written down value? You will go left side. The written down value is, is zero okay so if you are now selling this let's say after one year two year three year four year whenever you are selling this asset then how it will be treated let's say now you are selling this asset for rupees three lakh so if you are selling this asset obviously it would be more than zero and if it is getting sold for up to five lakh it will be your business income taxable under section 41 pgpp income but in case if it is getting sold for more than five lakh this is your capital gain area this is your capital gain area so let's say if it is getting sold for 6 lakh rupees so in this case if it is getting sold for 6 lakh so from 0 to 5 5 lakh would be your section 41 deemed business income and 6 minus 5 6 minus 5 would be your capital gain taxable in the section 50a so 6 minus 5 is 1 lakh would be your capital gain but remember here if it is long term if it is getting sold after three years then in that case it would be long term six minus you have to do the indexation of five lakh correct so this is section 50a got it so this i have already uh shown you here in your notes as well okay section 50 double a section 50 double a is an amendment i have already discussed with you it's a small amendment but important important for your mcq purpose 
that whenever you will sell now whenever you will sell your after 1 4 2023 that is from our previous year after 1 4 2023 whenever you will sell your market linked debenture specified mutual funds market linked debentures are those who are, whose returns are not fixed they are their returns are related to the market conditions so if you are if you are ever sell your market link debenture market link debenture please remember this word because this word can come in your examination if you will ever sell your market link debenture or specified mutual fund specified mutual funds which were acquired on or after 1 for 2023 where specified mutual funds are those where not more than 35 these are debt mutual funds where not more than 35 percent of their corpus are towards their equity not more than 35 so basically they are debt mutual funds that this is called as specified mutual funds so if they were acquired on 1 for 2023 and now if you sell this they will always be short term they will always be short term right so this is a uh, important amendment you can expect i i mm, feeling i'm getting this uh, intuition that you can expect one mcq on this especially in may 2024 examination and on this market link debenture they will give you this particular name market link debenture okay then is comes another section 50b slum sale Guys, slum sale is uh, whenever you sell your assets, whenever you sell your most of the assets with your liabilities, that is you sell your entire undertaking, whether whenever you sell your entire undertaking or uh, one of your department, if you sell where you do not assign the value to each and every asset, where you do not assign the value to each and every asset, but you sell it for a lump sum consideration that is called slum sale. 50B is the uh, so-so for examination. It uh, comes in your examination it might not come in your examination but again i'm saying that the treatment is very easy so it says section 50b says whatever is your full value of consideration that is the selling price minus cost of acquisition minus obviously expense on transfer you will get, get net consideration then cost of acquisition cost of improvement but here you don't have to take cost of acquisition and cost of improvement in in, in fact Instead of cost of acquisition, cost of improvement, you have to take the net worth of that undertaking. Whatever the undertaking which is getting transferred, you have to take the net worth of that undertaking. So the question is how we will be calculating this net worth? Very easy. To calculate the net worth, you have to take the total assets minus outside liabilities. Whatever the total assets value is, you have to take the total assets minus outside liabilities. So it will be given to you. What is the to uh, value of the total assets? You have to minus the outside liabilities only. Please minus only the outside liabilities. Do not min uh, minus your equity share capital. Do not mention your reserves. Do not minus your reserves only. Please do not subtract your internal liability. You have to subtract your outside liabilities. That could be your creditors. You have to subtract bank loan debentures etc you can subtract that right so that you can get your net worth okay let me explain it more so first of all once you will be taking a full value of consideration what is the full value of consideration the actual selling price but you have to compare it with the fair market value also if fair market value is also given that on this date if you have sold your undertaking with a lump sum price if you have sold the undertaking with a lump sum price then whatever is the actual price you have can take that full value of consideration but if in your question fair market value also of that date of fair market value of which date 1 for 2001 no i'm saying fair market value of the date on the, which this undertaking is getting sold let's say you are selling it for rupees let's say 90 lakh you are selling it for rupees 90 lakh on which date you are selling it let's say let me take a date 15th of december 2023 you are selling it if in your question fair market value of this date is also mentioned if in your question fair market value of this date is also mentioned please consider that you have to take full value of consideration as 90 lakh or fair market value whichever is higher this is important you have to take the full value of consideration once you will be computing your capital gain please take the full value of consideration please take the selling price as the actual selling price or fair market value of the date of selling price whichever is higher this is important please remember this okay okay second thing is that then you can subtract your expense on transfer you will get net consideration then you don't have to take cost of acquisition and cost of improvement generally we subtract cost of acquisition and cost of improvement here instead of this you have to take your net worth how you will take your net worth total assets minus outside liabilities 
So what kinds of assets you might have? You might have depreciable asset. You have to take the depreciated value. You have to take the depreciated value. Here, how examiner will, will ask you this question. He might give you that there is a, some depreciable asset. Let's say there was machine, right? Machine is a depreciable asset. He will tell you that the machine value is rupees, let's say 5 lakh. He will say that the machine value is 5 lakh. But we have not claimed the depreciation for the last two years. We have not claimed the depreciation of the last two years. So you have to take the depreciated value of that machine while calculating your net worth. How net worth will be computed? Total assets minus outside liabilities. Getting it total assets minus outside liabilities. So total assets, how you will take it? Total assets, if first of all, if it they are depreciable. If nothing is mentioned, then you can take the value. But if it is mentioned that assets has, let's say any depreciable asset, let's say machine it has. Machine was of rupees 5 lakh, but the examiner is telling you that we have not claimed depreciation for the last two years. Then please claim depreciation on that. We understand that our machine general rate is 15%. So please apply two years depreciation on that. 5 lakh first, you apply 15%. Uh, you will get 75,000 as depreciation. Then the value would be 4 lakh 25,000. Apply one, one more time 15%. Whatever you will get, that is the depreciated value. So for depreciable asset, you take the depreciated value, right? For any asset, where 100% deduction is claimed, where 100% deduction is claimed, please take the value as zero, where or any asset, let's say if it is a specified business asset, right, specified business asset, section 3580. So in that case, you please take the value as zero, please take the value as zero. Third thing, for other assets, for other assets, please take the value as the book value, whatever the book value, please take that value. For depreciable asset, written down value, assets where 100% deduction is claimed, nil, other assets, book value, and if it is a self-generated goodwill, please take the value as nil. So for self-generated goodwill, please don't take any value, take value as nil. So these are the value of the assets, and from this assets value, you have to subtract the outside liabilities of that particular unit which is getting sold, of that particular unit. Sometimes it, uh, it might give you, you uh, must have done some questions on this in your regular classes that they will give you a balance sheet. They will say that there are two units, unit one and unit two, and unit two is getting sold. So please sub take the assets only of that unit, which is getting sold, right? If it is unit two, take the assets of uh, unit two and take the liabilities also of unit two only. You have to take the net worth of unit two. Logical? Okay. One more thing if you should remember that if there is any revaluation of asset, you so you have you do not have to consider that revaluation effect. Please ignore that revaluation effect. So if because assessee will try to increase his net worth. Why? Because he would like to increase his cost. Because instead of cost of acquisition, cost of improvement, we are taking net worth. So in this case, he will try to increase his net worth by revaluating it upward. So you, if this any of your assets, especially your land building, if anything is revalued upward, please cancel that revaluation effect and take the original value. So if any asset is revalued, nullify the effect of revaluation also. I think you are able to recall that. Second thing, if it is long term, how it will be long term? If this uh, undertaking was for more than three years, then we will say it's a long term gain. If it is not more than three years, we will say it is short term. I'm again repeating in slum sale, if this undertaking, the undertaking which is getting sold, if it is for more than three years, please take it long term. If it is not more than three years, take it short term. If it is long term, so should we have to do the indexation also of net worth? No, indexation is not allowed here. So 50B, I was telling you in the beginning that there are some cases where even if they are long term, then indexation is not allowed. So this is one of them, right? On debentures or bonds, we don't do indexation except capital index bond or servant gold bonds on uh, this one also 50B also. And also I've also discussed with you that non-residents or foreign uh, companies, if they invest in foreign currency and if we apply first proviso to section 48, indexation is not allowed. Here also indexation is not allowed in 50B. So even if uh, this is long term, then no indexation is allowed for net worth. And 50B can be long term or short term. I have already told you if the life of this undertaking is more than three years, then it is long term. Otherwise, it is short term. Got it? So this was lump sale. So now come to section 50C, very important section for examination. And this section is um, frequently asked by examiner. Although it's an easy section, I tell all sections these are easy, but this is again is an easy, easy section. 
it says that if you other assessee has sold their land or building it is for real estate transaction if you sell your land or building then whatever you will say that is that is your actual selling price we will take it but we will compare it with the stem value we will compare it with the step value stem value will be given in your question so if your stem value is higher then we will take your full value of consideration as your stem value then we will not take your actual selling price we will take your stem value if stem value is higher if stem value is lower or equal to then it is fine but if stem value is higher we are going to take your stem value as full value of consideration but there is a grace also allowed if the difference between the stem value and the actual selling price is not more than 10 percent if this difference is not more than 10 percent so 10 percent difference is allowed if the difference is more than 10 percent then we will take the stem value but if the difference is not more than 10 percent then we can take your actual selling price as your full value of consideration so how you will do it let's say assess this will uh, is saying that sir i have sold my land for rupees 50 lakh he has sold his land for rupees 50 lakh okay so what is the stem value of this particular land whenever he has sold this let's say his stem value is 52 lakh so should we take 52 lakh as deem selling price because stem value is higher we will see whether the difference is right now the difference is how much 2 lakh just 2 lakh we will see the difference is exceeding 10 percent or it is not uh, not exceeding 10 percent if the difference is up to 10 percent we will ignore that we, we will take 50 lakh as the willing uh, as the selling price but if the difference exceeds this 10 percent then we will take the stem value as the deemed selling price so here tell me is actual price is 50 lakh is actual price is 50 lakh so the right now the difference is coming just 2 lakh just apply 10 percent on it so 10 percent on 50 lakh is 5 lakh so if the difference would have been up to 5 lakh that is acceptable we can accept up to the 10 percent up to 10 percent difference so here the difference is just 2 lakh which is not exceeding 5 lakh so 5 50 lakh price is okay for us because the difference is not exceeding 10 percent you can take it as at this uh, to, uh, by this way also that you have to take the difference by 10 percent or you can take it by other way also that you have to compare you have to take the actual selling price just take 110 percent of this and compare it with the stem value this is something this is same this is just mathematics either you can take the difference of 10 percent or you can do 110 percent of the actual selling price so in case of transfer of land or building or both the full value of consideration is the sale price but if the stem value exceeds 110 percent if the sale stem value exceeds 110 percent 110 percent of what 110 percent of the actual selling price if stem value exceeds that value then stem value will become your full value of consideration otherwise if the stem value and uh, the actual selling price difference is not more than 10 percent we are okay we will take your actual selling price as your uh, full value of consideration right second important thing is that which date stem value you should take the date on which you are transferring this asset the date on which you are uh, the stem value of the registration date because whenever we sell our land or building we register this particular place in the name of someone else in the name of the buyer so whenever is the registration date you take the stem value of that particular date but if assessee mentions that sir actually i am getting this asset which is less than the stem value because there was a prior period agreement there, there was a prior date agreement and i have to prove that this i can also prove that that there was a prior date agreement there was a transaction which had happened i have given some consideration that to by through account pay check so if assessee can prove if assessee can prove yes sir this it was a it is less than the stem value but please don't take the stem value of registration date please take the stamp value of the agreement date why Sir, because I have a prior date agreement, I have a prior date agreement. So he has to prove that, that there was a prior date agreement. So how he can prove it? If he can prove, sir, I have paid some consideration, either full consideration, partial consideration, any amount. If any amount is paid to the seller through account pay check, account pay draft, bank draft, or through any banking mode, not through cash. If it is through cash, then this is not taken as a good evidence right it will not be taken as a proper evidence then we will take the stem value of, reg of registration date but in case he can prove so there was something amount which was paid to the seller by way of account pay check account pay demand draft any banking channel then yes we can take the stem value of the agreement date also so uh stem value on the date of generally it should be the date of registration 
but we can take the stem value of the date of agreement also if it can be proved that any amount of consideration any amount not we are not seeing the full amount of consideration but any amount of consideration if it is paid through uh, account paycheck ecs any ft rtgs in other words through banking channel then we can take the stem value of the agreement date also right second thing is that can the assessee can challenge these stem value the answer is yes assessee can challenge this stem value and he can ask the assessing officer sir this stem value is actually not correct it is not the true picture i request you to please appoint a valuation officer please appoint a valuation officer and please send your valuation officer to value this property correctly so in case assessee requests the assessing officer and valuation officer is appointed then we will take the value as given by the valuation officer so imagine valuation officer go and checks the, uh, the check that particular property and he finds that the actual value is less than the stem value actual value is less than the stem value then we will say okay now we will take the value as determined by the valuation officer but if valuation officer comes and he brings a value which is higher than the stem value we will say sorry sir we don't require this valuation officer he has came up with the value which is higher than the stem value sir we don't want such valuation officer no sir please take stem value in that case so if valuation officer brings a value which is less than the stem value we can take that value as full value of consideration but if valuation officer come and he brings a value which is higher than the stem value we will ignore them in that case we will ignore that valuation officer value we will take the stem value only but remember valuation officer can bring us lesser value than stem value but he cannot bring a value which is less than the actual selling price right because actual selling price is something which assessee is agreeing so if let's say the stem value is let's say 60 lakh actual selling price is 40 lakh so if valuation officer brings a value lesser than the stem value let's say 50 lakh 45 lakh 42 lakh we can take this value but if valuation officer comes with such a less value which is actually lower than this actual selling price also let's say valuation officer comes up with the value of 38 lakh should we take 38 lakh in that case no at least the minimum value would be the value which assessee is himself saying so assessee was saying 40 lakh it should not it cannot go below 40 in this case correct so valuation officer value can be adopted if it is less than the stem value but it should not be that much value that it should be below the actual selling price no it should not be below the actual selling price right i have written it also it should not be less than the actual selling price and you remember this section 50c same provisions we have in pgvp similar provisions same provisions in fact we have in pgvp also as section 43c 43c also has the same provisions okay next se section is section 50ca 50ca is regarding unlisted shares because it is quite difficult to uh, get the value of the unlisted shares so in this case if assessee is saying that that person is has sold unlisted shares so whatever is the actual selling price we can take the full value of consideration but it should not be less than the fair market value it should not be less than the fair market value so we have to take the actual selling price or fair market value whichever is higher right for us it's a very small section 50 ca it says that if unlisted shares are getting sold unlisted shares are those which are not listed in any of the stock exchange so if unlisted shares are sold the actual selling price with the assessee is saying it should not be less than the fair market value right 50d again a very small section it says in case in case there is any asset which is if there is any capital asset which is getting transferred and the full value of consideration could not be determined then in that case we will take the fair market value in that case we can take the full value of consideration would be the fair market value on the date of transfer simple uh, section not that important but yes you should know in case the consideration price is not ascertainable then we can take the fair market value next section is section 51 four feature of advanced money this four feature of advanced money you will uh, be doing in ifos chapter also i'll tell you what it is so if there is any negotiation do you remember the section 51 four feature of advanced money so if there is any negotiation which is going on between um, buyer and seller and buyer in this case gives any token money to the seller that yes sir i will be purchasing this particular asset after let's say one month two months and please take this token money five lakh rupees and a uh, seller will say okay i'll uh, take this five lakh rupees as a token money remaining you can uh, the, the remaining amount you can pay after two months right within two months you can pay this amount but in case the buyer 
is not able to pay the amount or in if there is any particular thing which has happened that this contract does not get materialized so whatever the amount which this buyer has given as a token money as advanced money it will be forfeited by the seller it will be forfeited by the seller so how it will be treated how this amount would be treated so it depends whether this amount was forfeited before 1 4 2014 so there is a date of 1 4 2014 whether this amount was forfeited before this date or on or after this date if this amount is forfeited on or after 1 4 2014 if this amount is forfeited on 1 4 2014 on or after 1 4 2014 then simply make it ifos income this we will read in ifos chapter also in section 56 2 it is mentioned 56 is the charging section of ifos it is mentioned over there that whenever the amount is advanced money is forfeited on or after 1 4 2014 please remember this date 1 4 2014 on or after 1 4 2014 it will become ifos income no other treatment no other treatment in the year in which it is forfeited please make it ifos income but if this amount is forfeited before this date before 1 4 2014 that is up till 31st march 2014 if any advanced money is forfeited in that case section 51 will apply section 51 says that whenever this amount is for, 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 forfeited if it is before 1 4 2014 then it will not become income in the year in which it is forfeited it will not become the income if it is before this particular date it will not become the income of that year in which it is forfeited but whenever this capital asset will be transferred by this person whenever this capital asset will be subsequently transferred by this person who has forfeited this amount so we will take his cost his cost will be reduced by the amount which was forfeited his cost will be reduced by the amount forfeited which amount forfeited which was forfeited before 1 for 2014 why because we have initially we have not made it your income we have not made income for you in that case we will wait whenever this you will sell this asset but who will sell this asset the person who has forfeited the amount the person who has forfeited the amount if he will sell this asset on any, any subsequent date then whatever is the selling price that will become full value of consideration cost whatever is was was his cost it will be reduced by the amount forfeited but if this amount was forfeited after one april to on or after one april uh, 2014 then there is no requirement to do that adjustment there is no requirement to do that adjustment because or anyways uh, any amount which is forfeited after one or after one april 2014 we have made it income of that very year correct so please remember that any amount forfeited before this date should be reduced from the cost whenever this asset be, would be sold but please remember this point whenever this asset is sold by the same person who has forfeited the amount then you have to reduce it from the cost if this asset is sold by any other person then you cannot reduce it let's say let's say there was mr x mr x has forfeited an amount of rupees 3 lakh let's say before 1 april 2014 i am giving you a date 1st of february 2014 this is one before 1 for 2014 so he has forfeited 3 lakh rupees there was some negotiations happening some buyer has given him 3 lakh rupees but eventually he was not able to purchase it uh, and lastly 3 lakh was uh, was forfeited by x okay and it was 1st april 2000 first uh, february 2014 before this date what we will do of 3 lakh we will not do anything of this 3 lakh the, it will not become income of this year but we will wait whenever mr x will be selling this asset let's say after some time 3 4 5 10 years he is now selling his asset let's say he is selling his, this asset by in previous year 23 24 let's say for rupees 100 lakh for 1 crore he is selling this asset. 100 crore will 100 lakh will become full value of consideration let's say his cost was 30 lakh so his 30 lakh would be reduced by 3 lakh and on 27 lakh will become his cost and if it's a long term we will do indexation of 27 lakh so first we do indexation then then we will subtract no first subtract then whatever you will the amount is received after subtracting that amount forfeited then you have to index that if it is a long term right if x is selling this asset but let's say x transfer this asset to his daughter x transfer this asset to his daughter and her his daughter is now selling it his daughter is now selling it then we understand whatever is the selling price that will be the full value of consideration less cost of acquisition with the cost of the previous owner cost of the previous owner let's say was 30 lakh but please don't reduce this amount forfeited why because I, I have said that i have already mentioned you that if the same person who has forfeited the amount if he's selling that 
then you have to reduce it. If someone else is selling that, then you don't have to reduce it. Sir, so in that case, this what will happen to this 3 lakh? Nothing will happen. It will not be taxable. It was not taxable because um, it will not be reduced on the cost because someone else is selling it. Correct? If someone else transfers the asset, then it will not be reduced from cost. So this was section 51. Now there is family of section 54. Section 54 deals with exemptions. So there are certain exemptions which SSE can claim in while calculating their capital gains. So we, have, we have to do section 54, 54B, 54EC, 54F and 54D also. Although 54D is not that important but still it's a small section we will do 54D also. So first of all section 54 and there is an important amendment also. In section 54 there is an amendment almost similar amendment but uh, in section 54 there is amendment in section 54F there is amendment. These two sections are more important for our 2024 implications. Okay. Let me discuss about section 54 first. Section 54 is allowed only and only to individual or HUF. It is not allowed to any other person. First of all, it is allowed only to individual and HUF. And it is when, when they sell their, when they transfer their residential house property. Whenever they sell their residential house, then it, if land is transferred, 54 will not be applicable. If any other capital set like gold, shares, etc. is transferred, 54 will not apply. 54 only applies when residential house is supplied, is transferred. It is uh, sold, residential house is sold only for individual or HUF. This can be claimed. How much? It should be a long term asset. So if residential house is sold and there is any long term capital gain, they can claim exemption also. How? they can invest this amount they can invest this amount in another residential house property they can buy another res residential house property or they can purchase any other residential house property so they have sold residential house property they have to purchase or they have to construct any other residential house property who only individual and HUF. okay so can they purchase two properties also the answer is yes they can purchase two residential properties also but there is a restriction over there if your long term capital gain is more than 2 crores and if you have transferred any one residential house and if the long term capital gain is more than 2 crores then you can purchase only one residential house property not two. If it is more than 2 crores you can purchase only one not two. But if it is not more than 2 crores if it does not exceed it is just up to 2 crores if your capital gain is coming let's say 1 crore 50 lakh 60 lakh not more than up to 2 crores then you can purchase two residential house property this individual hf can purchase two residential house property but this option of purchasing two residential house property is once in a lifetime it's option it's a once in a lifetime option it means that if any individual or hf has exercised this option of purchasing two residential house property this time in any subsequent assessment year they cannot claim it again they cannot claim it again they can only purchase if let's say after five years ten years uh, 15 years they have sold one more residential house property and their capital gain is also not more than two crores can they again go and purchase two residential house property the answer is no this purchase of two residential house property option is only once in a lifetime of SSE. correct but only please remember it is only when their gross capital gain is not more than two crores and i have written over, written it over here this two residential house property option is available only once in a lifetime second thing is that what is the time limit of purchase or construction? Sir, if they would like to purchase the residential, let's say they have sold one residential house and they have a capital gain, let's say of rupees one crore. If they uh, would like to um, make, uh, get some exemption, then they have to purchase or construct a residential house property. What is the time limit? If they would like to purchase it, they can purchase it one year before or two years after. Total three years, but it is one year before or purchase it is one year before or two years after they can go and purchase the residential house property. If they would like to construct it, then they have three years after they have transferred this asset. After that, it is not before in that case. In, cons in purchase, it was one year before also and two years after also. But in construction, it is only three years after. Three years, within three years, you can, within three years, you can go and construct your residential house property. Okay. Second thing is that now we have been given so much of time for construction. We have given three years for purchase. We have given one year before, two years after. But because we have to file our return up to the due date. So what we have to do is there is a capital gain scheme which is available to you. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Capital gain scheme is always available in, in those cases where uh, law gives you so much time to invest because 
if you are purchasing a res new residential house property it um, is not necessary that you will be able to purchase the next month one month two months you might take some time because it is quite uh, these these kinds of decisions are quite a lifetime decisions so if you would like to purchase a residential house property you might uh, take some time right so in, but you have to file your return in this very uh, up to this due date why because you have the capital gain in this year so they have said that you can also invest in the capital gain scheme so whatever you will invest in the capital gain scheme up to if you will if you are not able to purchase a residential house property if you are not able to construct the house property up to the due date of roi then please we have a capital gain scheme uh, available to you you can go and deposit the amount in the capital gain scheme so whatever amount you will deposit in the capital gain scheme it is assumed that this is the amount which you have invested so whatever the amount you, if you have purchased or you have constructed or if you have deposited in the capital gain scheme then you can claim it as an exemption but there is an amendment over here maximum amount which you can invest is 10 crore rupees maximum amount which you can invest here is 10 crore rupees or in other words i can say there is a limit of 10 crore so um, this is an amendment this is an amendment so it says whatever is the amount you have invested in um, amount invested where either in purchasing residential house property up to the due date of roi or you have uh, constructed it or if you are not able to construct it or purchase it to the due date of roi you have the option to deposit it in the cg scheme so whatever the amount you have deposited in that capital gain scheme or in the new house or gross capital gain this was earlier this was these two uh, points were earlier also but third point is added over here or rupees 10 crore whichever is lower whichever is lower so this is important right so examiner can ask you question on this please don't go above 10 crore maximum deduction which you can get is 10 crore rupees right and whether this exemption can be withdrawn also later date only any later date the exemption can be withdrawn the answer is yes sir if you have claimed an exemption by purchasing a residential house or by constructing a residential house so this house should not be transferred before three years if you have transferred this asset before three years then we will um we will we'll withdraw this exemption second thing is that if you have invested the amount in cg scheme if you have invested the amount in cg scheme then because the end motive is that you should purchase the residential house or you should construct the residential house within this 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 period right uh, construction should be in within three years purchase should be at least one year before or two years after but if you have just invested the amount in CG scheme, but if the period is expired and you have not utilized this amount in purchasing the, the residential house or in constructing the residential house and this period is expired, then also exemption will be withdrawn. And in that case, whenever this period will be expired of two years or three years, we will take maximum of three years in this case, because as I can say, sir, I, am, I would like to construct it. So please give me three years. So whenever this three years will elapse, in that case and if this amount is not utilized properly then in that year capital gain will arise in that year capital gain will arise or if you have purchased a residential house new house but if you sell this house within three years then also capital gain exemption will be withdrawn and how it will be withdrawn whenever you will we will be calculating the capital gain on that whenever you are selling this new asset whenever we will, we will be calculating it we will be reducing that exemption claim earlier from your cost right so this is the important but this one is most important this amendment how much reduction is available next section is 54b 54b is related to agriculture land it is very much similar to section 54 in 54 individual and hf can claim exemption here also individual and hf can claim exemption in 54 residential house was sold residential house has to be purchased here agriculture land is sold agriculture land has to be purchased right so which agriculture land obviously rural agriculture land if it is sold then it is not a capital gain so there is no point in exemption in claiming exemption but if this was an urban agriculture land because an urban agriculture land and tell me what tell me if agriculture urban agriculture land is compulsory acquired again it is exempt but if you have sold uh, urban agriculture land and there is a capital gain you can claim exemption you can claim exemption by purchasing a agriculture land and this new agriculture land which you are purchasing it can be rural agriculture land also or it can be your urban agriculture land also so there is no problem in purchasing the risk of the agriculture it should be agriculture land it could be urban or rural but the agriculture land which is sold is obviously it it was a urban agriculture and that is the reason you are claiming exemption so it says that this uh deduction of section of exemption of section 54b is up available only to individual and hf 
asset transferred in the agriculture land which agriculture land which you are using it for agriculture purpose either you are using your parents are using it or the huf to uh, whom you belong they are using it for agriculture purpose for at least last two years for at least last two years you are using it type of capital gain could be long term or short term but obviously it would be long term because we understand that if you are using it for at least last two years so after two years it becomes long term asset amount invested should be in agriculture land only and this amount invested the new agriculture land could be urban or it could be rural that is okay with us time of purchase because you are you don't have to construct it right you have to purchase it we are giving you two years within two years you should purchase it and in case of compulsory acquisition please tell me in case of compulsory acquisition you understand if agriculture land is compulsory acquired in that case it would be exempt it could be exempt then there is no point in claiming exemption but here it is also why i have written it at this point here also because in fact this was applicable in section 54 also that in case of compulsory acquisition in case of compulsory acquisition because you have to purchase within this house you have to purchase uh, within uh, one year before or two years after and in construction you have to construct within three years from the date of transfer but what happens in compulsory acquisition let's say your residential house is compulsory acquired and once it is acquired within three years you have to construct it but let's say imagine a situation where you are not getting compensation for next two three years so how you will be able to purchase because you have not received the compensation so there is a section 54h you don't have to remember the section number there is a section 54h it will say it will say that in case of compulsory acquisition in case of compulsory acquisition we will extend this period so we will take three years not from the date of transfer but from the date when you have received the compensation right so in all the sections it is whenever this uh, period is given to you in case of compulsory acquisition they will extend this period they will not take from the date of transfer rather they will take from the date when you have actually received the compensation correct okay so in 54b let's come back to 54b 54b how much is the deduction available amount invested or gross capital gain whichever is lower and whenever if you will uh, transfer this agriculture land within three years from the date of purchase then if you are selling it after three years then it's okay but if you are selling it before three years then your exemption will be withdrawn whatever the exemption which you have given it to you it will be withdrawn how it will be withdrawn whenever you will be selling this asset we will be reducing it from the cost whatever the exemption which was claimed earlier we will be reducing it from the cost right but yes there is a loophole over here because if you would have purchased a rural agricultural land if you have originally urban agriculture land was sold there was a capital gain and you have purchased a rural agriculture land you can purchase rural agriculture land yes we can purchase we can claim exemption and we will say sir this new land should not be sold before three years so let's say now it is a rural agriculture land this new land is a rural agriculture land let's say you are selling it for after one year two year three years so whenever you will sell we will reduce it from the cost while computing capital gain but the question is if you will sell your rural agricultural land there would be no capital gain computation why because it is not a capital asset so there is a loophole over here if the asset is selling their rural agricultural land before three years also nothing will happen exemption cannot be withdrawn why because the method of withdrawing exemption is reducing from the cost while computing our capital gain so we will not even compute our capital gain because it is a it is not even a capital asset right so it will it can only happen when you have sold originally it was urban agriculture land and you have purchased also urban agriculture land so if you sell this agriculture land this new urban agriculture land within three years then we can um, withdraw the exemption by reducing it from the cost right but yes if you have invested in the capital gain scheme then capital gain scheme amount should be utilized up to that date and if it is not utilized we will claim the we will withdraw the exemption also next section is important although there is no amendment here but this is important section 54 f there is an amendment section 54 ec 54 ec says that if you if there this section is first of all this section is available to all types of assets we did section 54 we did section 54b that is only for individual and hf but here 54 ec is available to all types of assets even partnership firm even company can claim this exemption right if the assets has sold if the assets has transferred their land or building or both even if land is transferred, any land, any building or both, if it is transferred, then assessee can claim a um, exemption by investing in bonds, 54 ECs investment in bonds. 
so if it is a long term land or building or both is transferred even if it is a de depreciable building but if it is a long term let's say we understand that on that depreciable building short term gain because we understand there is section 50 section 50 says even if you're uh, if you sell your depreciable asset then it will always be short term but let's say if that building is three more than three years old or more than two years old we understand after, if after two years it becomes long term so if that building is more than two years old then also you can claim exemption over there so a uh, type of capital gain it would be long term and it can be short term also because if a depreciable building is sold which is of more than two years or three years we understand for building we take two years we understand that it will result into short term capital gain because of section 5050 okay so amount to be invested if you have sold land or building or both where you have to um, invest the amount it should be invested in the bonds of which bonds you have to invest the, invest in the bonds of NHAI or RECL or other notified bonds. So mainly it is NHAI, National Highway Authority of India or RECL, Rural Electric Corporation Limited. You can invest in these bonds or other notified bonds like Power Finance or Indian Railways Finance also. But please remember NHAI and RECL for examination purpose. So amount to be invested in these bonds and this amount should be invested for minimum five years. For minimum five years, you should invest this. You can invest it for five, six, seven, eight years, but it should not be less than five years. So these bonds should have a maturity of minimum five years. Correct. When you have to invest it, it should be invested within six months. It should be invested within six months from the date of transfer of your asset. Whenever you have sold your land or building, whenever you have sold within six months, you have to spend it. So this is a favorite question of examiner. They will tell you that a CSE has invested some amount he has invested before six months with, with that is within six months and some amount he has invested after six months. So whatever the amount which is invested after six months, you please don't give any exemption related to that particular amount. So only the amount which is invested within the period of six months from the date of transfer of that land or building or both. In that case, only exemption can be provided. Right. Second thing is that how much is it capital gain scheme is applicable over here? The answer is no. Why? Because why not capital gain scheme is applicable because in capital gain scheme you have to invest the amount here also by use by purchasing bonds you have to invest the amount so in that case in earlier case you have to purchase land you have to purchase uh, in section 54b you have to purchase land because purchasing land is not that easy it might take time because um, you have to look at uh, which land i would like like to choose i would uh, like to buy in section 54 you would uh, you have to think which house i have to buy so it might take time so their capital gain scheme was applicable but here you just have to invest the amount so it will not take much time so capital gain scheme is not applicable in section 54 c 54 ec sorry because why because anyways you have to invest in bonds if you will invest in capital gain scheme rather it is good that you directly invest into the bonds right away right so here cg scheme is not applicable for you amount of deduction would be lower of the phone like whatever is the amount invested or capital gain or rupees 50 lakh whichever is lower you understand this 50 lakh rupees is the limit which is applicable it is not this year amendments it is before as well so last year also it was 50 lakh in fact for last three four five years it is 50 lakh only so whatever is the amount invested or gross ltc or 50 lakh whichever is lower you have you will get this deduction so maximum deduction which you can get in this section is section is amount 50 lakh because this is also again a favorite question of examiner. They will say that a CSE has invested rupees uh, 655 lakh, 60 lakh within six months. So please don't take more than 50 lakh rupees. So whatever is the amount invested, let's say amount invested 55 lakh, gross capital gain is 60 lakh, but maximum you have to take 50 lakh is the fixed amount, whichever is lower, 50 lakh is the maximum deduction which you can claim. CG scheme is not applicable. Withdrawal of exemption. Can exemption be withdrawn? Yes, sir. The minimum investment time was five years. So if you sell this, these bonds, NHI, RECL bonds, if you sell before five years, then capital gain scheme will be uh, the exemption which you have gi given it to you, it will be withdrawn. Correct. Or even if you take loan against such bonds, even if you take loan against such bonds, then the uh, exemption will be withdrawn in this case also. 54F. 54F is um, again important because there is an amendment. Maximum amount which you can invest here is maximum is 10 crore. 10 crore limit is now inserted over here. This is one single amendment which is 
here is section 54f so section 54f says that it is available only to individual nhf again only to individual nhf if you sell if you sell any asset other than residential house other than residential house if it if you sell any long term asset so if you are selling your um, long term jewelry long long term gold you can claim exemption under section 54f if assessee is selling their long term shares they can come under section 54f if assessee is selling their residential house no 54f is not there for residential house if assessee is selling land land is okay land is allowed residential house is not allowed but any asset any long term asset other than residential house even land if the assessee is selling they can come under section 54f so it is available only to individual and hf who does not own more than one house who does not own more than one house so if assessee already has two house three houses four houses then 54f is not available because why 54f is allowed if assessee has sold any other asset other than residential house and this exemption will be given if he has purchased residential house if he has purchased he has to purchase residence the amount should be invested in residential house but if he already has more than one residential house he can have one but if he has more than one then this deduction is not available to him so type of capital asset which should be transferred it should be any long term asset it should be your jewelry it should be shares it could be any asset other than residential house it could be even land also right plot of land is also eligible but it should be except residential house and amount to be invested amount to be invested should be in residential house and the same uh, time period we have given it to you if you would like to purchase a residential house it should be one year before or two years after if you would like to construct the residential house it would be three years would be given to you amount of exemption is important amount of achha, tell me whether capital gain scheme would be uh, applicable the answer is yes why because we have given you so much time for purchase we have given you one year before two years after for construction we have given you three years so capital gain scheme would be available to you if you are not able to invest before the due date of roi please go and invest in the capital gain scheme second yeah this is important some something amount of deduction amount of deduction would be the capital gain or amount invested amount invested upon net consideration so this is a proportional deduction you will get so whatever is the amount invested divided by net consideration what is net consideration net consideration is full value of consideration minus expense on transfer so whatever is your capital gain which you have getting by selling your jewelry by selling your shares by selling your land or any other any other long term asset except residential house capital gain into amount invested upon net consideration but this the amendment is here the amount invested should not be more than 10 crores it should not be more than 10 crores this is an amendment the amount invested should not be more than 10 crores withdrawal of exemption can this exemption can be withdrawn the answer is yes the new residential house which you have purchased it should not be sold before three years if it is sold before three years then we will be uh, be uh, withdrawing your exemption second thing is that you don't have to sell this new residential house and also you don't have to purchase any other residential house also within three years if you purchase any other residential house also then also exemption will be withdrawn or if you have taken the exemption by um, depositing the amount in the cg scheme then you understand that cg amount the cg scheme amount should be utilized before that particular date that is within two years or three years and if it is not utilized up to that particular date then exemption will be withdrawn right so these things are written over here the new house should not be transferred within three years or uh, otherwise we will uh, whatever the exemption which you have given we will make it long term capital gain or the amount deposit in cg scheme should not be misutilized it should not be mi either misutilized or it should not remain unutilized also if it remains unutilized up to that particular date which is three years from the date of transfer then we will make it long term capital gain and also the assessee should not purchase any other house they are saying also because uh, what was the major condition over here the assessee should not have more than one residential house so here the law says that you, this 54 exemption is not given to the assessee who are quite rich it is 
given to the SSC who are not that much rich. So 54 exemption F exemption is only for those SSC is only for those individual rich who are, who are not that rich, right? So if you are purchasing another residential house within three years, then also exemption will be withdrawn, right? This note is quite important related to section 54 F. This is important. Let me explain you with an example. Let's say there is a question in your uh, in your exam that Asethi is Mr. A. He has sold his gold and land also. He has sold two things. One is gold and one is land. Let's say full value of consideration is uh, 50 lakh rupees. He has sold the gold and for 30 lakh he has sold the land. Less you will subtract expenses on transfer let's say there are no expenses on transfer less you will subtract index cost of acquisition whatever is the index cost of acquisition and now you are getting that the capital gain the capital gain on gold is let's say it is 10 lakh and on on land it is 5 lakh. on land it is 5 lakh okay now the capital gain is 10 plus 5 15 lakh is the capital gain now assessi has invested this amount whatever he has received the amount he has invested in let's say residential house and it is mentioned in your question that he has invested rupees 60 lakh in a residential house 60 lakh he, he can invest not more than if it is more than 10 crore you have to take maximum 10 crores correct okay so this person has invested 60 lakh in residential house now please tell me in section 54 f 54 F is available to individual ratio, assess is individual available. Second thing is that he, if he has transferred any long term asset other than residential house, gold, okay, allowed, land, covered, allowed. So he has sold these assets and now he has invested in residential house. So how you will do it? Should you do it like this way? That total capital gain is 10 plus 5, 15. So capital gain is 15. What is my... Uh, calculation but what is the formula of uh, getting this exemption it is capital gain into amount invested upon net consideration upon net consideration right so you will say capital gain 10 plus 5 15 into amount invested let's say it is 60 lakh upon net consideration was let's say there was no expense on transfer net consideration is 50 plus uh, 30 80 lakh should you do this way no you should not do this way what you will see here you will apply your section 54 f one by one first you will apply on one asset then you will apply on second asset so how you will apply should you apply first on gold then on land no first of all in this case this guys i am telling you this will happen in only in 54 f this is not going uh, this particular provision this particular concept is only for 54 f right because here you get proportionate deduction why proportionate because here it is a formula based deduction capital invested in into this i used to explain in detail in my regular lectures but right now i would like to make it um, bring this point over here because this is something very important right so here what have we, what you have to see which asset which asset is giving me high percentage gain which asset is giving me more percentage gain so the asset which is giving you more percentage gain you have to shoot that asset first it is same like i used to give this example in my regular classes that let's say if there are two demons there are two demon one is big demon one is small demon demon and you have only one bullet in your gun you have a gun with you and there are two demons standing in front of you one is very big and, and the other one is quite small so if you have only one bullet in your gun First, you will shoot which demon? So that the demon which is huge. First, you will shoot that particular demon. And the small demon, even you can fight with your hands and legs, right? So in this case also, you have to identify who is a big demon, who is a big demon. How you will identify which particular asset is giving you more percentage gain? So you have to, in this case, you have to do a ranking. You have to do a ranking who is the big demon and who is a small demon. So in this case, you will calculate percentage of gain percentage of gain how it is calculated it is very easy whatever is the gain which you have divided by net consideration it will give you percentage of gain so how much is the capital gain the capital gain is 10 lakh net consideration was how much 50 lakh just calculate the percentage 10 upon 50 percent is 
20%. So the percentage of gain of gold is 20%. And what is the percentage of land? That is 5 upon 30. Simple. Capital gain upon net consideration into 100. Or percentage. You have the calculator. Where is my calculator? Okay. Uh, 5 divided by 30%. So this is 16.6. 6% so first you have to calculate which particular asset is giving you more percentage gain so here 20% and 16.66% so 20% is more percentage gain this will rank as 1 you will give rank 1 to this and rank 2 to this so here first of all please don't club it together and do, do not apply that 54f formula on the entire two assets all together no First of all, you have to shoot this asset. You have to shoot gold first. Why? Because this is giving you more percent. This is giving you more taxes. This is leaving more taxes on you. So how you will be identify how which particular asset will is leaving more tax on me by calculating this percentage gain. So you have to calculate percentage of gain. So first of all, in this cases, guys, I'm again telling you this would be applicable only in case of 54F. It will not be applicable anywhere else. Only in case of 54F. And when, when the assessee has sold more than one asset and he has invested or he or she has invested in one residential house, then you have to apply this particular concept, percentage of gain. So first you will, whatever the amount you, uh, first you have to nullify this amount. This is first, you have to shoot first big demon and then comes to the small demon. So you have to null, nullify this gain, 10 lakh rupees. So how, how much amount you have invested? 60 lakh. So to nullify this, whatever is the net consideration, apply first 54F, first apply 54F on this one and the remaining amount you should apply on this one. So what you will do is the 60 lakh amount which you have invested, so this is the amount invested. This is the amount invested. So make it split this into two parts, split this amount invested into two parts. First split it for gold and then whatever the remaining amount, then keep it for another asset. Here it is land. So first of all, to nullify this 10 lakh, to nullify this 10 lakh, so whatever is the amount which you have received, whatever is the amount you have received uh, while selling this gold, you have to make it uh, while, while uh, applying that formula, please make that amount invested to that amount. So it would be 50 lakh rupees. So amount invested would be 50 lakh rupees in this case. And out of 60 lakh, 50 lakh would be invested towards gold and 10 lakh you will apply towards land. Whatever the remaining amount is, you will apply towards land. 10 lakh would be on over here. So if now less 54F and what is the formula 54F? So capital gain into amount invested upon net consideration. So tell me, first of all, apply on gold. So how much is the capital gain? The capital gain is 10 lakh, 10 lakh into amount invested. How much is the amount invested? Whatever is the net consideration for this gold? 50 lakh, you have already mentioned it over here. 50 lakh upon net consideration was 50. So this 50 by 50 will become 1, 10 into 1 will become 10. So you have nullified this 10 lakh rupees. So this is 10 lakh. So Capital gain was 10 lakh on gold. You have claimed exemption under section 54 F 10 lakh. And whatever is the net capital gain, nil. You have sh you have shot this big demon. You have shot this big demon. Now, out of 60 lakh, out of 60 lakh, you have already used the amount invested of 50 lakh over here. Whatever is the remaining amount? 10 lakh. So please apply that 10 lakh over here. So what is the 54 F? If you will apply 54 F over here apply that formula capital gain is 5 lakh correct capital gain is 5 lakh into amount invested how much 60 lakh no out of 60 lakh you have already used 50 in while uh, applying 54f in gold so 10 lakh would be the amount invested divided by net consideration is 30 so in this case it would be 10 divided by 30 into 5 lakh so this would be 1,66,667 would be the 
exemption. So out of five, this would be the exemption. So remaining would be three lakh thirty three thousand three 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 would be your capital gain. I believe that you must have done in your regular lectures also, right? The students who have taken class from me, you have recalled, and also I believe that from whomsoever you have taken the class, this has been discussed also in your class, right? This was fifty four F. So in this case, you will get your capital gain as three lakh thirty three thousand three three three. Please tell me if you would have applied it all together, then what will happen? This capital gain would be have been more. So your client, your your client would have been um, would would be very uh, angry with you because you are not calculating the capital gain correctly. Let let me give you that figure also. If you have taken the capital gain combined, if you have if you would have applied fifty four F on a combined value, see in that case, let's say if you have applied capital gain on the combined value, how much is the capital gain? So ten plus five fifteen lakh. Okay, so fifteen lakh is your capital gain. Just apply fifty four F by taking this combined value. It says fifty four F says the formula is capital gain into amount invested upon net consideration. Capital gain is fifteen lakh into amount invested. How much it was amount invested? You can take the combined value sixty lakh divided by net consideration. How much is how much is the net consideration? Total combined fifty on gold, thirty on land. It would be eighty. Just apply it. Sixty divided by eighty into fifteen lakh. This would be eleven point two five, and subtract it from fifteen lakh. So this is three lakh seventy five thousand would have been the net capital gain. This on this three lakh seventy five thousand you have to pay tax. But no, here our capital gain. The our correct answer is three lakh thirty three thousand because. Here you have used your fifty four F judiciously, right? You have used your fifty four F efficiently, right? Effectively, you have used this fifty four F. So this is how examiner, if you will calculate in this way in your in your exam, examiner will going to cut it, right? Although you have applied the correct formula, but you have not applied your mind over here. Here fifty four F says correct it. Clearly, that if there are more than two assets, and then you have to apply fifty four F, then you have to shot your first big demon first. Please shot your big demon first, and then there is a small demon. Then whatever the amount, whatever the bullet which you are left with, or with the energy which you are left with, then fight with that particular person. So here we how we will identify the big demon or the small demon by applying the percentage of gain. How percentage of gain? Whatever is the gain is divided by net consideration, you will get the percentage of gain. You just have to roughly calculate this. Just to identify, to give them rank, you just have to roughly calculate this. That whatever is the percentage gain. So if this is the big demon, this is small demon. Apply nullify this gain first. Nullify this gain first. So this gain was ten lakh. So how it will be nullified? Whatever is the net consideration, just apply net consideration towards this. Got it? So I believe that you must have revised this concept also. Okay. So this was fifty four F. Last section in section fifty four series is fifty four D. Although not very important for examination, rarely I see this type of um, this fifty four D in examination. But still, again, not very difficult. It's easy. Fifty four D is the compulsory acquisition. If you have any factory building, if you have any factory building, and if that factory because this fifty four D is only uh, will apply only for those. Businesses who are into manufacturing operations, who are doing, who are industrial units, who have their factory, right? Only for those units who have their factory. So, if assessees, if assessees land or building is compulsory acquired by government, in that case, fifty four D will apply. So, what he has to do is, if this land or building is, if, if his factory is land and building, why I am saying factory because it is only available for manufacturing unit. We can also call it as industrial unit. So, if factory or uh, factory land or factory building is compulsory acquired, then whatever is the capital gain, they if they would like to get an exemption, they can they have to purchase they have to purchase an, uh, another land or building for factory purpose only. Then they can claim fifty forty. So it says eligible assets. Who is the eligible assets? The person. It could it could be individual. It could be H U F. Even it could be partnership firm. It could be company also. Those who are into Manufacturing business, they have their factory. Those who are industrial unit, that is manufacture. Only those person can claim fifty forty. Asset transfer. What was the asset transfer? It was their land or building which was compulsory acquired. 
which they were using it for their industrial purpose, which they were using for their factory purpose for at least last two, two years. And it is compulsory acquired. If even if it is compulsory acquired, then 54D will apply. If they have sold this land or building voluntarily, then 54D will not apply. It is only for in the case of compulsory acquisition. Right. Type of capital gain could be long term or short term also. Amount invested, where they have to amount, uh, invest the amount in new land or building for factory purpose. For industrial purpose, they have to uh, purchase this land or building and time period allows is three years. If three years is allowed, CG scheme would be available to them. How much is the amount of deduction? Whatever is the capital gain or amount invested, whichever is lower, amount invested or capital. Everything will remain the same like 54, like 54, simple. Everything will remain the same as 54. Now, amount invested or capital gain, whichever is lower. There is no limit of 10 crore over here. 10 crore is only in section 54 and now in 54F. It is not in 54D. Withdrawal of exemption. If this new land or building is sold before three years, then exemption will be withdrawn or you have not utilized that capital gain scheme amount, then also exemption can be withdrawn. Not that much important. I have rarely, rarely seen 54D come in examination. 54EC is important, but because of amendment 54 and 54F will is more important this time. Okay, 54H, 54H is a simple section. This section is not related to exemption. This section is just is saying that if in case any, because we give you time limit of generally two years or three years of construction, two years of purchase from the date of transfer. But this I have already discussed that if it is the case of compulsory acquisition, then your period will start from the date when you have received the compensation those three years or two years as the case may be it will start from the date when it when you have you have received the compensation right so it says 54 it says that if the capital asset is compulsory acquired if it's compulsory acquired the time period for investment in new asset under section 54 54 b 54 d and 54 f and so on will start from the date of receipt of actual compensation and not from the transfer date that is logical okay now we have section 55 cost of acquisition and cost of improvement in certain cases generally it deals with intangible assets cost of acquisition it says that if you will sell your goodwill goodwill is a capital asset if you would sell your goodwill whether it is a goodwill of a business or it is a goodwill of a profession if you sell your goodwill you sell your right to manufacture produce or anything if you have a right to manufacture see this is also a capital asset this is a kind of intangible asset if you have a right to manufacture anything and that right is not with anyone else, you, you only have the right and you have a copyright also on that. And if you sell this right to someone else, then again, capital gain will arise, right? Because what you are transferring, you are tra transferring an intangible asset. That is a right to manufacture or produce anything or right to carry on any business. You have a, you have a sole right that you can only carry such type of business and you have a patent or copyright also on that. If you sell this particular right to manufacture or produce anything, then also capital gain will arise. So if you sell goodwill, right to manufacture, right to carry on any business or any other intangible assets also, this intangible asset is an amendment over here. I'll tell you why this has been added over here. If you sell your trademark or your brand name, let's say I have a brand name. I can sell my brand name. I can sell my logo to someone else. So if you sell your trademark or brand name also, then capital gain will arise. If you sell your tenancy rights, stage carriage permit, lumas, these all are intangible assets. So if you sell these assets, then capital gain will arise. But if these are self-generated assets, if these are self-generated assets, then your cost of acquisition will be nil. If these are self-generated assets, the cost of acquisition of all these assets will be nil, right? Even if you say, even if you say that, sir, I have acquired these assets before 1-4-2001, one, 1-4-2001, four, one, four, can I take the fair market value? The fair market value of 1-4-2001 option is also not available over here. Because just see, just think, it cannot be available because no, nobody can say that, sir, I have acquired this goodwill. I have, I have, this is my self-generated goodwill and I'm carrying my business before 1-4-2001. I can take, can I take the fair market value? The answer is no. Because fair market value cannot be determined in this case. Correct. So it says that even the note is mentioned over there, the option of taking fair market values in 1-4-2001 is also not available for these assets. So if they are purchase then you can take the purchase value but if they are self-generated their cost of acquisition will always be nil and what about the cost of improvement for these four assets for these four assets 
the cost of improvement will always be nil. But for trademark, tenancy rights, stage carriage permit and loomers, you can take the cost of improvement. Actual cost of improvement you can take. But for these four assets, what are these? Goodwill, right to manufacture, right to carry on business or any other intangible assets, cost of improvement will always be nil. This is an amendment. Why? Why government came out with the why income tax came out with this amendment? Because some people were transferring their goodwill. Let's say some people, some Mr. X was transferring his goodwill, and he was saying, sir, this is not goodwill, this is something else. And he was taking the cost also. So people were giving their goodwill by different names. They are giving different names to their goodwill, they are giving different names to right to manufacture, they are giving different names to right to carry on any business. So now it has been stopped over here. Income tax has said. If you give it any name, if you give it, if you call, if you call goodwill, goodwill or by any other name also, then also we will take the cost of acquisition as nil if it is self-generated and cost of improvement will always be nil in these four cases. But in these cases, if there is any cost of improvement, which SSC has incurred, they can take this, right? And if the above assets are purchased by the SSC on the previous owner, then purchase price shall be taken as cost of acquisition of um, the previous owner also if they are purchased then you can take the purchase price of the previous owner right and you understand on goodwill because goodwill now goodwill is not depreciated but yes if you have claimed depreciation because it there was an amendment till previous year 99 till previous year 1920 you can depreciate goodwill but after that it was an amendment that now from previous year 2021 onwards there would be no depreciation on goodwill so if you have already taken, if it is a purchased goodwill and you have already taken a depreciation up to 1920, you have already claimed depreciation. So whatever is a depreciated value, then we will take your depreciated value as your cost of acquisition. This is not so important for your examination. This point is not so important for examinations. And this I have already discussed. For first four assets, these assets, cost of improvement will always be nil. And for these assets, if there is cost of improvement, you can take the cost of improvement also. Okay. Next section is 55A, reference of valuation officer. Uh, this Generally, this section come, can come in your theory uh, because this uh, pre pre previously examiner used to ask this 55A in theory. So can assessing officer, if assessing officer has doubt regarding your value, if assessing officer has doubt regarding your value, can they refer to the valuation officer? The answer is yes. In these cases, in these three cases, the, there are three cases, one, two and three. In these cases, assessing officer can refer to the valuation officer also. First of all, if in your computation, if assessing officer feels, if assessing officer feels that in your computation, you have taken a fair market value in while computing your capital gain, if you have taken the fair market value whether it is your, in your full value of consideration or it is your cost of acquisition, if you have taken a fair market value and assessing officer has doubt regarding this fair market value, then they can refer the valuation officer. I give you an example. Let's say, let's say there is an SSE, Mr. A. Mr. A has diamonds. Mr. A has diamonds, which he has purchased on 1 7 1992 for rupees 2 lakh this per this person has purchased diamonds on 1 7 1992 for rupees 2 lakh and now in this previous year 23 24 he is selling these diamonds for let's say of rupees 2 crores he is selling diamonds of rupees 2 crores these diamonds which he has purchased long back now he is selling for rupees 2 crores capital gain will arise so in this year Full value of consideration would be 2 crores, right? Less. Expenses on transfer, let's say there are no expenses on transfer. Cost of acquisition, cost of improvement, we have to take the indexation also. Index cost of acquisition, let's say. There is no improvement, only cost of acquisition is there. How much is the cost? The 2 crores. And since it was purchased before 1-4-2001, here it is important. Since it has purchased before 1-4-2001, we will take the fair market value as on 1-4. 2001. We will take the fair market value of 142001. So this guy says, sir, the fair market, Mr. X says, sir, the fair market value as on 142001 is rupees, let's say 80 lakh. It was 80 lakh. He comes out with this figure. 
how he came out with the figure he has bring a cert he he brought a certificate with him there was some valuer there was some uh, diamond merchant he he, he uh, brought a certificate from that merchant it was a private valuer he has given him some money and that that person has given him a valuation of 80 lakh rupees now he is saying that my sir i have to i can take the fair market value as on 14001 because I, this um asset was purchased before this particular date and it is mentioned in law that i can take the fair market value and how he came this fair market value by taking a certificate from any private valuer he has came out with this value and now he is saying sir my cost of acquisition i will take as 80 lakh ci of the year of transfer let's say for this year is 348 and i can take the ci of 2001 and 2 it was 100 so how much it will be 348 divided by 100 it would be 2 crore 2.784 crore right i have taken in crores so he is saying that there is a loss in fact now there is a loss of 78 lakh 40 thousand he is saying that there is a long term capital loss please tell me in this entire calculation is fair market value used anywhere the answer is yes sir fair market value is used either in full value of consideration or in cost of acquisition here in this case it is used in cost of acquisition AO has doubt regarding this fair market value AO, AO has doubt regarding this fair market value He's he is of the opinion no this fair market value is not correct in this case he can go and approach the valuation officer he can go and approach the expert and here he can approach the fair uh, valuation officer also so first case is where the assessee has taken the fair market value in our case it has he has taken a fair market value in cost where the assessee has taken the fair market value either in selling price or in cost price in our case it was in cost and such estimate is made by a registered valuer and he is saying that sir there was a registered registered valuers are private valuers he has given him some money some one or two lakh and he has given him a value of 80 lakh as the uh, fair market value of diamonds so if AO has doubt regarding this value then he can go and uh, take a reference to the valuation valuation officer is again a income tax employee but he is a expert in determining the value so he can take the reference of valuation officers this is one case Second case could be where AO has doubt that whatever the selling price was, which assessee is saying is not correct. Whatever the selling price is assessee is saying he is, it is not correct. The fair market value is something else, but assessee is saying a lesser value. And if the difference is fifteen percent, if the difference is fifteen percent, then he can go and check uh, the check it with he, he can go and take the reference of valuation officer. Whether there is a difference of fifteen thousand rupees or twenty five thousand rupees, whichever is the lower. 15% of such value or, or 25,000 rupees, whichever is lower. If assessing officer has doubt, he can go and refer this case to the valuation officer also. And third is, if the nature of such capital asset, if the nature of such, let's say it is an archaeological collection and AO has doubt and AO, AO is not able to determine what should be the value of this archaeological collection, he can also refer this case to the valuation officer. So this is 55A. What are the cases where AO can refer this case to the expert expert is valuation officer so this is 55 okay the next is about bonus shares and right shares see bonus shares are the cost of acquisition should be taken as nil because assessee has received these bonus shares without any paying anything to the company so the cost of acquisition would be nil but in case the bonus shares are acquired before 1 4 2001 then we can take the market value as of 1 4 2001 as the cost of acquisition so bonus shares it's easy cost of acquisition is generally nil but if they are acquired before 1 4 2001 then you can take the cost of acquisition as fair market value as on 1 4 2001 okay if these are right shares right shares are given to the existing shareholders but at a concessional price so if i am an existing shareholder of some company and they are giving me an offer that would you like to purchase right shares also and we will give you at a concessional amount i'll i can say yes i can say no also if i say yes i would like to purchase these shares so if i purchase these shares so whatever is the concessional price will become my cost whenever i'll sell these uh, right shares then the selling price whatever the selling price will become full value of consideration cost price is the concessional amount which i have paid to the company but also i have an option i can also deny that offer whenever the company gives me a letter that if you would like to purchase it please intimate us within 30 days generally they give us within 30 days i have to intimate to this to the company 
So if I said no, I don't want to purchase it. So there is no problem as such. Uh, these right shares will not come to me because I have, I have not declined that offer. Nothing will happen. But you also understand this, this letter which I received from the company that whether you would like to purchase these right share at a concessional value, this right is transferable also. This right is transferable because this is also kind of asset because I have a right to purchase the shares of that company at a concessional amount. So I can transfer this right also to someone else. If I transfer this right to someone else, then also capital gain will arise. So what I am doing is I am transferring the letter, the, the right offer letter which I have received from the company. If I transfer this letter to someone else, then whatever the amount I recover from that particular person will become the selling price of this letter. And what was the cost of this letter? Zero. So the cost of acquisition is nil and it will result in short term capital gain. Why short term? Sir, because this letter has a life of not more than 30 days. So it will be a short term capital gain in my hand. And what will be the cost of the right shares in the person to whom I have renounced these shares, to whom I have transferred these, uh, this right and this person will apply to the company that I would like to purchase this share and this because this right was transferable. So he can also apply to the company and com company will issue him the right shares at that concessional amount. So the concessional amount which he, ha he has paid to the company will become the cost to him. Additionally, also add the amount which he has paid to me. So the amount which he has paid to the transferer of this uh, right also that amount plus the amount which he has paid to the company just um, add these two amount it will become the cost of right shares for that particular person in whose favor this right shares was renounced right. So this is written over here if you will sell original shares cost of acquisition of the original shares, shares is actually purchase price. If you sell the right shares, the right shares, if you, the person who has received the right shares, right, that person only, he has exercised the option that I would like to purchase the right shares. So for him, the amount paid for acquiring right shares will become the value of the right shares. But if the right is renounced, if that letter is given to someone else, then whatever is the amount he will get, that will become the selling price and the cost of that letter is then and right shares purchased by third person. If Right shares are purchased by third person. So their cost will become the amount paid to the company and amount paid to the transferer for purchasing that right. So total amount club together will become the cost of acquisition. Correct. Okay. Now this is rate of tax on capital gain. Do you remember the first chapter revision which we have discussed where I have talked about the special rate of taxation. Uh, you must have remembered that. So let's say if there is an SSC, let's say if there is an SSC, Mr. A, Mr. A is there and he has certain income. He has income from salary. He has income from house property, PGBP, capital gain, IFS, etc. And whatever is his GTI, then we have to give deductions under chapter 6A also. And chapter 6A deductions can only be given from normal income. It cannot be given from your triple one A, do you remember that triple one A, one one two A, one one two? It cannot be given from that. Only from other income you can give deductions. Okay, I'll tell you that. So this is the GTI. Let's say if Assessi has income from different heads, this is GTI. Then we have to give a deduction under Chapter Six A, and after Six A we have our total income. So how you will calculate your tax on total income? So first of all, you have to see what is, is there any special income? Because if there is any special income, then it has to be charged at that special rates. So we understand we will do some parts of it. Uh, we will give, uh, we'll do uh, two parts of it. One is special income and another is normal income. And special incomes are of different kinds. So first of all, we will see that if we have any long term capital gain, which is chargeable at a rate of 20%, we will write it over here. Then if we have triple one A, I'll also explain what is triple one A. On triple one A, that is short term capital gain, equity shares or equity oriented units. Also, one more thing is there, uh, units of business trust, but units of, units of business trust is not in CA intermediate syllabus. That is in CA final. That, that we will do in CA final. So triple one A is your equity shares or equity oriented units. If you sell or in a stock exchange where STT is charged, right? So triple one A is chargeable at 15%. This all I have mentioned uh, this in the first chapter, first chapter revision also. And if you have, these are all special rates. If you have 112A, that is long term. If you sell your equity shares or equity oriented units on stock exchange where STD is charged, that is called 112A. It is taxable at 10%. And please remember one more thing regarding 112A that 
whatever is your amount, whatever is the income here in 112A after 1 lakh, then you have to apply 10% rate. Let's say you have income of rupees 5 lakh in 112A. So you can, you should you apply 10% on entire 5 lakh or after deducting 1 lakh? Did you remember that after deducting 1 lakh, on 4 lakh you will apply 10%, right? So uh, first of all, out of your total income, you have to see if there is any special income. So if it is long term capital gain, it is chargeable at 20%. If it is triple one, it's 15%. 112, it is 10%. And then if it is your casual income, casual income or winning from game shows, etc., it is 30%. And if it is your unexplained income, like your unexplained cash credit, unexplained investment, unexplained expenditure. So these unexplained income is taxable at a rate of 60%. And then comes your normal income. Then comes your normal income. Right. Normal income is taxable at normal rates. If it is individual HUF, etc., then slab rate. If it is partnership firm, then flat rate of 30%. Whatever is the normal rate, normal income is taxable at normal rates only. First of all, uh, this I will be discussing in chapter deductions also, in chapter 6a also. First of all, please remember that 6a deduction is only available from normal income. If it is long term capital gain, triple 1a, 1 1 2a or casual or unexplained income, you cannot get chapter 6a deductions from here. Right now, I am concerned mostly about uh, capital gains. So these three sections are related to capital gains. Please remember that chapter 6a deductions cannot be claimed from these three. These two are long term capital gain you cannot claim chapter 6a from long term capital gain and this is short term capital gain but only that short term which is related to equity shares or equity oriented units on which stt is charged right from other short term because other short term is part of your normal income you can claim deductions of chapter 6a from there but not from long term uh, of 20 percent not from long term of 112a and neither from triple one a also so 6A, did, uh, so now it is okay with you, all of you, that 6A will not be charged from, you cannot claim deduction of chapter 6A from these special income, it can be claimed only from normal income. Second thing, if you would have remembered this, that in case, if the assessee is resident individual, if the assessee is resident individual or resident HUF, in that case, you will apply slab rates, right? And if this normal income is less than basic exemption limit, if it is, there is any unexhausted basic exemption limit, let's say assessee is, um, is opting for default tax regime, then the basic exemption limit is 3 lakh. If the assessee is not opting default tax regime, the person is opting optional tax regime. And if they are, it depends upon their age and resident. And if they are not more than 60 years, then uh, the basic exemption limit is 2.5 lakh. If they are 60 years or more, up to 79 and resident, the basic exemption limit is 3 lakh for super serious citizen is 5 lakh. This is all thing I believe that you all uh, remember all these things. So if this normal income only, this is only in case of guys, only in case of resident individual net shift. If this normal income, if this normal income is less than the basic exemption limit, that we call unexhausted basic exemption limit. So can we fulfill this unexhausted basic exemption limit from our special income? The answer is yes, we can fulfill it. From where? We can fulfill it first from LTCG from this LTCG is section 112 actually. So we can fulfill it section from section 112 or we can uh, fulfill it from triple one A if it is not avail uh, available in if the amount which is there in 112 if it is not sufficient, then we can take the help of triple one A. If required, then we can take the help of 112A also. But we cannot, if there is any unexhausted basic exemption limit, so we can fulfill it only from these three. And first of all, you have to uh, keep this order only first from LTCG 20%, then from triple one A, then from 112A also. And I have explained you in the first chapter revision also why we follow this order. And if there is still any unexhausted basic exemption limit, it cannot be fulfilled from casual income or unexplained income. No, you can only fulfill it from here. But that is only in case of resident individual and HUF. This is something which we have already discussed in the in first class, in basic concepts revision lecture. Right. Okay. So I was telling you what is the uh, rate of capital gain. So we have two types of capital gain. One is long term, other is short term. So these two are long term. So generally on long term assets, we have rate of depreciation of 20%. We call it 112. There is one more exception for some uh, uh, for some assets which are listed debentures or listed securities. You can also apply 10% rate that to without indexation that I'll be discussing with you in the next five minutes. Okay. 
but generally for long term capital gain the rate of depre uh, the rate of uh, i'm saying depreciation sorry the rate of tax is 20 percent and for 112a these are also long term these are equity shares or equity oriented units which are sold on uh, stock exchanges where stt is charged where there the rate of tax is 10 percent but yes please remember that for all sse one lakh exemption is available whatever this amount in 112a please deduct one lakh then in excess of one lakh on that amount you have to charge 10 percent so long term capital gain is chargeable at 20 percent that is 112 and if it is 112a it is 10 percent if it is short term if it is normal short term if it is you have sold gold or you have sold any other assets which is not equity shares or equity oriented units if you have sold other short term assets then it is chargeable at normal rate otherwise if it is triple one a if it is triple one a then it is chargeable at 15 percent what is triple one a equity shares or equity oriented units which you sold on recognized stock, stock exchange where stt is charged this stt also has one exception if this transaction is taking place at IFSC, if this transaction is taking place at International Financial Service Center, this is actually is based in Gujarat and Gift City. This is for non-residents. So we are giving incentives to them. So if the transaction is happening at IFSC, then even if STT is not paid, even if STT is not paid, so if there is a transaction of equity shares or equity oriented units, even if the STT is not paid, but this transaction is happening at IFSC, in that case, that can also be covered in triple money or 112A depending upon the holding period. If it is short term, it can come in one one uh, triple one a If it is long term, it will go in 112A. In, in spite, there was no STD, but the transaction was uh, happening at IFSC. So this these all things are mentioned over here. So I have already discussed rates of capital gain. So if it is long term, first of all, come to long term. For, if it is long term and if it is 112 normal long term 20 percent in some cases it is 10 percent i'll tell you where but but generally on 112 it is 20 percent 112 a it is 10 percent please remember then in excess of one lakh then only tax at 10 10 percent i have already discussed let's say if your capital gain of 112 is 6 lakh then please subtract one lakh from it remaining on remaining amount apply 10 percent if it is short term so one is triple one a if it is triple one a 15 percent and if it is not triple one a other than uh other short term apply normal rates on that okay so one one two a is what if you sell your equity shares or equity oriented units units of business trust is not right now we will do in ca final so if you uh are selling your equity shares or equity oriented units where on stock exchange where stt is charged where stt is charged then the rate of tax would be 15 percent but yes there is an exception of ifsc it is mainly for non-residents so if the transaction is happening at ifsc then this stt requirement is also not there right an important note if uh, it is a resident i have already mentioned i uh, discussed this if the assess is the resident individual or resident huf and if they have basic exemption if they uh their normal income is less than basic exemption limit then you can fulfill it from triple money but please first fulfill it from 112 that is 20 percent if it can be fulfilled from 112 it's fine but if it could not be fulfilled from 112 then come to triple one a and if it could not be fulfilled from triple one a then come to then you can also take the help of 112 a also so for resident individual hf unexhausted basic exemption limit can be used from triple one a chapter 6 a deduction is not available from this it is not available from triple one a it is not available from 112 a it is not available from 112 also long term also it is not available chapter 6 a deductions can only be claimed from normal income from other short term we can claim chapter 6 a deduction so chapter 6 a deduction is not available rebate 87 a is available rebate is available from here but rebate is not available from this income so if you have a tax on this income rebate is not available rebate is available from this rebate can be available from this of course from this rebate is available but no rebate is available from 112 please remember this one also if you have a tax on this income you cannot claim rebate from this income right okay then long term capital gain 112a uh, there is a note over here that std deduction is never allowed yes guys please remember in section 36 in section pgbp while doing our pgbp we know that if a sse is having his business of selling shares then std can be claimed as a deduction in pgbp but in capital gain std cannot be claimed as deduction you cannot say that these are expenses on transfer no expenses on transfer could be your brokerage or commission but if 
uh, you are calculating your capital gain please remember this if you are calculating your capital gain please do not deduct any expenses related to STD. STD is not allowed in capital gain. STD is allowed only in PGBP. If it is your business income, then you can claim STD. So I can say brokers can claim STD because that is their business income. But normal person who are selling those shares as an investment, their capital gain is getting computed. So you cannot uh, deduct STD expense. Okay, 112A, it's on long term. So if it is short term, it will be called as 11 a triple one a if it is long term it will be called a one one two a and uh, takes on long term capital gain in case of equity shares equity unit units if it is long term that is more than one year rate of taxes 10 percent but please remember in excess of one lakh only you have to apply this 10 percent rate std must be charged same exception is ifsc exception is also here mentioned over here so on equity shares std must be paid on the purchase also and on the transfer date also and on equity unity units only on the date of transfer only at the time of transfer STD should be paid right and on purchase also for equity shares it is mandatory that at the time of purchase also you should have paid STD and at the time of sale also you have, should have paid STD but there is an exception uh, regarding to purchase if you have purchased equity shares but at the time of purchase STD was not paid why it was not paid because of these reasons because of these reasons then also it can be allowed under triple one uh, uh, under 112a so what are the these two condition one condition is that if the shares were purchased before 2004 because before 110 2004 STD concept was not there so let's say if I have purchased the shares in 2003 or 2002 <clears throat> so in that case sorry in that case I would not have paid STD because STD concept was introduced after 110 2004 right so if the shares were purchased before 110 2004 then you might not have purchased uh, you are not you might not have paid std also second thing if the shares were acquired from primary market if the shares are directly acquired from primary market because std is charged on stock exchange right so if the shares are directly acquired from primary market like in ipos or esops then in that case also if the std was not there it's okay it can be come under 112a also because equi for equity shares 112a says that std should be paid at the time of purchase also and at, at the time of sale also but at the time of purchase these are the exceptions even if the std was not paid at this particular time it's okay we will admit it as 112a only exception we know this i have discussed that for resident individual or HUF, unexhausted basic exemption limit, if it is required, then we can move it from 112A also. But yes, please remember that order. First from 112, that is from LTCG 20%, then from 111A, then from 112A. Deduction chapter 6A is not available. Rebate 87A is not available. From 112A, rebate is not available. Rebate can be allowed from 112A income. It can be allowed from 112, that is 20%. But from this 112A, that is long term equity shares or long term um, equity oriented units you cannot claim 87a rebate so this is important you cannot claim rebate over here you understand what is the rate of tax this one point is important regarding 112a so if you have because actually earlier these if you would have sold uh, your uh, if you are selling your shares or equity oriented units before 2018 before 2018 it was it used to be exempt it was covered under section 1038 it used to exempt but this 1038 was omitted from 2018 onwards because now this 112a was inserted so if you have acquired shares after 1st february 2018 if you have acquired shares after 1st february 2018 after 1st february 2018 this uh, section was there so if the shares were acquired before 1st April 1st February 2018, then you can take the actual cost as cost of acquisition. You can take the actual cost as the cost of acquisition. But what if the shares were acquired before this date, before 1st February 2018, that is on or before 31st January 2018. So at that time, 112A was not there. So there were cases that people were holding shares from last three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years. Let's say, let's say I have purchased a share in the year 2002. Let's say I have purchased a share in the year 2002 and was, I was holding this share for like for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I was holding this shares. So I was holding this share and it was long term. And I was of the impression there was a thought in my, in my mind that whenever I will sell, it will be exempt because at that time there, it was it used to be exempt. It was only in 2018 that this section came into picture. 
so i was of the a thought that whenever i will sell this will be exempt but in 2018 income tax came out with this particular section they are now taxing it at 10% so they have to give me a relaxation they have to give me a relaxation so what they have given me they say so whatever is your actual cost whatever if the shares were purchased before 1st february 2018 that is up to if the shares were purchased on or before 31st january 2018 then what you have to take the cost whatever is your actual cost whatever is your actual cost or fair market value as on 31st january 2018 whichever is higher whichever is higher so they have given me a benefit that you can take the cost as your actual cost for 31st january 2018 whichever is higher to nullify that effect to nullify that effect they have given me this advantage so actual cost of fair market value on, as on 31st january 2018 but they have also uh, also provided a restriction over here whenever you will be taking this fair market value as on 31st january 2018 it should not be more than your actual selling price it should not be more than your actual selling price so i believe you, you have recalled this point also this point is very important right and also important thing is that if we are giving you an advantage in 112a right because we are uh, giving you a very less rate of 10% so indexation is not allowed in 112a whenever you will be computing your capital gain it would be a long term but indexation is not allowed over here and the last is section 112 it is normal long term other than equity shares or equity oriented unit which are sold on stock exchange that is 112a other than that we have 112 so generally on 112 the tax rate is 20% the tax rate is 20% sometimes it is 10% also sometimes it is 10% also if listed securities generally debentures or zero coupon bonds which are sold which are listed which are listed so we give them an option we give them an option either if it is long term we give them an option either you can pay tax at a rate of 20% and we will allow indexation also but if if uh, you don't want to pay tax at 20% you have an option of 10% also without indexation you have an option of 10% also without indexation so generally the people who are selling debentures of long term so debentures in any case indexation on debentures or bonds is not allowed so they used to pay tax at a rate of 10% they used to pay tax of 10% so for other long term the rate of tax is 20% and for listed securities or zero coupon bonds that we have two option either 20% with indexation or 10% without indexation as per the benefit of the assessee right and this you don't have to do because this is for non resident if this is for non resident they have an option of 10% without indexation without currency fluctuation this you can ignore it this is not for ca enter this you can ignore it otherwise this everything i have discussed for individual resident individual in hvf if there is uh, unexhausted basic exemption limit it can be recovered from 112 also chapter 6 deduction is not available from this long term rebate 87a is available so guys this was the capital gain revision i have uh, tried to touch each and every topic of this particular chapter of capital gain now we will meet in our next revision that would be for ifos till then thank you so much bye and take care